say welcome. Conscious that this date was going to be a bit tricky for annual leave and things as we head into the summer. Just a few housekeeping bits, um, just to let everybody know we will be recording this um, event so we can share it more widely. My name is Amanda Stanford. I am the Chief Nurse at Airedale Hospital and the Exec Director for Midwifery and um, Allied Health Professionals. Uh, I'm also the Senior Responsible Officer for Better Births across Bradford District Craven and um, work with a fabulous team of people who drive the agenda for Better Birth. So I'm going to let them introduce themselves so they all know who uh, you all know who they are. So I'm going to go to Abby first. Thank you, Amanda. So my name's Abby Wild. I am the programme manager for the Better Birth programme and I'm a midwife by trade. So naturally, the workforce agenda is something that's really close to my heart. So I'm really excited for this morning's event. Thank you, for everybody, for joining us. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jill Paxton. I'm the Associate Director for Nursing and Quality and also a midwife um, at what was the CCG and I believe is now the Place Based Partnership, though that's up for debate at the minute. Um, and I head up the Choice and Personalisation Workstream subsection of Better Births. And Maria. Morning, everybody. Um, I'm the Project Officer on the Better Births programme, so I'm the one who's been um, probably doing everybody's head in, <laughs> asking them to, to join. So it's really nice to meet you all, um, especially our keynote speakers. So thank you. Lovely. So I'm not going to take too long with introductions. Suffice to say that um, the reason we pulled this together was because one of the priorities for Better Births is around our workforce. It's probably one of our biggest risks. Um, we've done a lot around safety. Of course, that's a priority for us. So and we've also done a lot previously around perinatal mental health and we've done a lot around health inequalities so they're the real priorities for us as part of better births and workforce is our other key area of focus and i just want to put some context around that so we know that there has been a huge amount of scrutiny of maternity services and we recognize that that can have an impact on our workforce so one of the priorities for us in Better Births is really the challenge we've set ourselves is how do we reset the narrative around midwifery? How do we make sure that people looking at careers in healthcare see midwifery as one of those top careers? Um, and really this is to kick off. So this event is to kick off that focus for the next 12 months. We have very close links with our university colleagues and we really want to explore with people on the call today about what are some of the pebbles in your shoes? What are some of the future strategic aims and directions of midwifery workforce? We've got some fantastic speakers and I just want to say thank you to those people who have given their time to come and talk to us. And we're really looking forward to hearing what you've got to say. But equally, we're really looking forward to hearing from everybody on the call and everybody's views. So I'm just going to hand over. Have a great morning. Thank you for your time. I'm going to hand over to Abby and then we're going to kick off the event. Abby. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, we're really excited to introduce our first speaker. Um, many of you will be familiar with the WELM study. Um, so I'd like to introduce Billy Hunter with supporting the emotional well-being of the midwifery work workforce, what can we learn from the WELM study? Welcome, Billy. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. I think, are you going to put the slides? Ah, yeah. <laughs> hi, uh, hi, everyone. Good morning. It's really great to be here. And thank you so much. It was particularly Abby, I think, sent me the first email. And then I've been liaising with Abby and Maria. But just thank you so much. It's a great opportunity to talk about the WELM study and you know it's a few years old now um, but people are still talking about it a lot and um, so I I want to focus on what we found in the WELM study but also what what can we learn with that which sounds like that fits with the agenda that you're working on in your trust which hopefully there's some insights here that will be useful. Um, so uh, next slide please. So the the background to the study, so the study was carried out in 2017, 18. Um, 
and um I think at that I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Because we get us, we're all talking now pre and post COVID. So all of this, the, the reasons for doing the Worm study were actually pre COVID, pre all the challenges that the midwifery workforce have had. Um, things were not were not good at that point either. So the the, the situation in the kind of um, you know leading up to 2017 was that there were known high levels of emotional distress in the UK midwifery workforce. The RCM had been doing various um, surveys which had led to the Caring for You campaign. And what had been identified was that that was then leading to low morale in the profession and attrition. The midwives were not staying in the job. So there was a chronic shortage of UK midwives. This feels like kind of like a cracked rec track record, doesn't it, in a way that we're still talking about the same things and we've had COVID in the middle. But and it, but that um, the shortage of UK midwives was attributable to retention of staff. There's similar concerns in other high income countries or in, actually in all countries across the world. Um, the State of the Mid World's Midwifery um, report last year identified a, a global shortage of about 900,000 midwives. Um, so, but even if you compare us with other similar high income countries, we seem to have got even bigger problems with hanging on to our staff. So, next slide, please. So, as a result of, of these concerns, the ICM um, asked us at Cardiff University if we could do, I mean, they had the, the RCM surveys, which were good indicators, but they weren't. Um, you know, they weren't robust research studies. So they asked us to conduct uh, the WORM study, which is the Work, Health and Emotional Lives of Midwives study. Um, now, this study had originally been devised by a team at Griffiths University, a midwifery research team, um, led by um, Jenny Gamble, who some of you may know, who's now in Leicester, uh, Jenny Fenwick um, and Mary Sidebottom. Um, and they had developed this uh, a, a large survey tool, um, which has now been picked up and used to research the midwifery workforce globally. Actually, many countries have used this, so they've got a well collaborative. Anyway, to cut a long story short, they agreed that we could use their survey tool um, and that we would adapt some of the questions just so they fitted better the kind of terminology of UK midwifery. <laughs> It's a, a really interesting tool because I'm sorry about the dog. I think the postman just came. <laughs> I'm just going to I'm just going to put my mic on mute just for a minute. OK, so I think <laughs> sorry about that, everybody. Um, hopefully it's not too distracting having him barking. So the aim of the study was to explore the relationship between the emotional well-being of UK midwives and the work environment. Um, and what we wanted to look at, oh, sorry, I'm really sorry. Can you just, I will have to go to the door for a minute. I'm so sorry. Whilst we've got a little break, I'll just uh, remind people that the Mentimeter is up and running. The link is in the chat for you to join. It's really easy to uh, interact with. Um, just pop onto the menti.com website, enter the code which is in the chat and you can join in with the interactive survey throughout the event. Thank you. Hi, I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> the joys of doing conferences by Zoom, isn't it? I didn't know the postman was going to knock on the door. <laughs> um, right, so the study aim, look at the relationship between the emotional well-being of UK midwives and, and factors in their work environment. And our specific research questions were, um, what, what are the socio-demographic and work-related variables? That correlate with high levels of emotional distress in UK midwives and what are the levels and predictors of burnout, depression, anxiety and stress in UK midwives and how prevalent is intention to leave the profession and what are the reasons and factors associated with intention to leave. So next slide please. Next slide please Abby. Sorry, it's Maria who's uh, controlling okay, the <laughs> slides. Maria, are you there? Uh, 
I can do them myself if you'd rather, if it's easy. Sorry, has it not changed over? Right? No, it's changed over. It's changed over for me. Methods? Yeah, it should be methods, but it's still on the research questions. Maria, you might have to stop sharing and put it back up again. Bear with me. The joys of teams, Billy. <laughs> Docs, postmen and IT that never works. <laughs> it was really lovely last week I went down to, to Brighton University. The students invited me to speak at their, at their conference. Um, and when I talked about resilience and caring for yourself and all about emotional well-being, but it was so lovely to do it in person and not <laughs> have this bit of protected time and meet people. So sorry, sorry, yes, it's not on right right now. Now. Yeah, that's lovely. That's perfect. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm um, just very briefly just about the research design. It was a cross-sectional survey. We asked for personal and work-related characteristics, and I'll show you what some of the demographics were. We use these validated tools to measure stress, anxiety, and burnout, which makes it, which what gives this, the study its rigor, because these are, are well-known and, and well-used and well-validated tools. And we also use questions from the RCM study um, why midwives leave, which is 20 years old. I was so shocked when I was just looking at this. This was actually led um, by a team that in included Mavis Kirkham. Um, so these, in the it just as an indicator that these issues are not new. They just seem to have got steadily kind of, of more and more concern, to be honest. So we invited all midwife members of the RCM to take part. And we ended up with a sample which was just under 2,000, um, which was 16% of the RCM membership. Um, we didn't include student midwives and we didn't include maternity support workers. We wanted to know about qualified midwives and what their experiences were. So next slide, please. Has that changed over yet? No. <laughs> Now? No? Not yet, no. There we go. So this is the, the demographics, just to give you an idea of who actually took part. So no surprises there, mostly, um, mostly female, the participants were. We look at age, the median age was 47. Um, what was interesting, we asked people, um, to whether to report whether they I would identify themselves as having a disability and that was high it was 12.5 percent and that included physical emotional psychological disabilities um, and that's much higher than if the workforce in general get asked that question at that point in time I think it was around five, about 5.5 percent would self-identify as having a disability so that's quite high um oh I've lost all my slides <laughs> Hello, love, you're all right. Um, I'm finding it difficult to see the screen, Maria, because all the people that are joining keep popping up. Uh, there we go. Right. So um, in terms of where people were based, mostly in, in England and mostly in, in London and the South and the Midlands. Marital status, most were married or in a civil partnership or cohabiting. Most were white British and a large proportion had caring responsibilities in terms of caring for children. So next slide, please. Just let me know when it changes over. Yeah. Has that changed over yet? No. <laughs> Sorry about this. It's OK. It's OK. I probably should have done, you know, because we decided. We decided you'd do it, but it, I could have done it. And so, uh, uh, and we've hopped out again now. I'm afraid I need the slides. It's a bit of a memory jogger because they're full of stats and things. So, here we go. 
so, so next next the next slide with the work related just so you oh I'm back that's, one. that one that's the one yeah so just in terms of where the midwives worked um about half of the sample worked in a district general hospital smaller numbers working in tertiary referral units and birth centers um but there was a sizable group who worked in community so that was quite interesting there to see some of the differences there um I'm just gonna I can't I can't read my slide because of the person waiting in ah there we go. Um most <laughs> of clinical practice. Um so that's so we got this sense of particularly of midwives working in clinical practice, mainly in hospital and some in community. And level of qualification, uh, over half there had um a degree level qualification. Uh, which re reflects the numbers of years of experience and the median number of years of experience was 15.1 years but the range there was vast from so from one one year of experience to 55 years of experience so quite a considerable difference there um, and one thing that we did do um, after the first analysis in the first paper we wrote was to do um, a more in-depth study of the experiences of newly qualified midwives so within the first five years of qualification um, because there were some particularly interesting findings coming out about that group being particularly vulnerable to emotional distress so I'll talk about that in a minute so next slide please so we asked about emotional health and well-being and we use something called the DAS scale, which is depression, anxiety and stress scale. And this gives scores for normal levels of depression, anxiety and stress, mild levels of all of those, moderate, severe and extremely severe. Um, the depression news, I'm afraid the WELM study, it's never very joyful presenting it, um, but we need to know these, these hard facts really about how things are for midwives. So over a third of the sample scored moderate and above on each of those subscales. So you can see that the stress score of moderate and above was 36.7%, the anxiety score of moderate and above was 38%, and the depression score of moderate and above was 33%. Um, and I think it's in the next slide, but when we compared that with some of the other countries in the WORM study, so you can see here we've yeah, back to that other slide. That's the one, yeah. So this is just comparing with Australia and New Zealand and Sweden, which you'd think would be relatively similar. We could see that the UK had a higher percentage of midwife scoring moderate, severe, extreme on all of those subscales. So for depression, anxiety and stress compared with the other countries. We had a higher number of respondents took part in the study. But as you can see, the numbers that we're reporting, so in the second in each grouping, the first line is normal to mild symptoms and then moderate to severe. Severe is the one I want you to look at because you can see that we that the UK was scoring considerably higher. Um, and you could do a lot of work and pondering about why that was. And we did as a research team, but it's certainly something for us to really seriously consider. So next slide, please. We're on to burnout now, I think. So burnout. So we use the Copenhagen burnout inventory, which is widely used globally um, and is thought to be a very robust measure of how people report how they're feeling in terms of burnout. And it has three subscales. It has a, a personal about personal burnout, work related burnout and what's called client related burnout. And on these subscales, this, this was quite shocking to me. So 83 percent of midwives were reporting moderate and above levels of burnout and 67% reporting work-related burnout of, of, of moderate and above. The, the good news was actually the client-related burnout, which is the burnout you experience in relation to the, the, your interaction with your clients and the care you're giving, um, those meaningful relationships with, with women and their families. Actually, that was, that was relatively low. That was 15.5%. So that was the good news. The other, the other subscales was was so worrying that um, the, the, the researcher in Denmark who developed the Copenhagen burnout infantry actually got in touch with us when the paper was published to check that we'd used his tool correctly and the statistician had got the stats right. And we had lots of interesting co correspondence with him because he was so shocked and he hadn't seen such high levels of burnout, which is very sobering. So next slide, please. 
And again, if you look at the UK in comparison um, with other countries, with Australia and New Zealand and Sweden, um, we had higher than other countries for personal and work-related burnout. That's the final column there. But actually slightly lower for client-related burnout. So again, that's a, a slight good news story. <laughs> Next slide, please. We asked about attention to leave. We asked, have you seriously thought about leaving the profession in the last six months? Um, and two thirds of midwives said that they had. So again, not very good news. The reasons that were cited, um, I think these are so significant and these keep coming out now, don't they? So dissatisfaction with staffing levels is no surprise there. But the second one about quality of care, which I think is so important because it comes through and it comes through in the qualitative data that midwives get their morale particularly gets affected when staffing levels mean that they can't give that quality of care because that's what brings midwives into the profession. If they can't give that care, then ultimately you burn out, you become demoralised and you just think there must be another job where I could get more um, purpose and meaning in my life. Next slide, please. So the most vulnerable in um, from what we could see in the statistics, we could see when we looked at the highest levels of burnout, depression, anxiety and stress, it was the younger midwives, so those aged under 41, and midwives was under 10 years experience. And of course, often those two are the same group. It is so depressing presenting this stuff to student midwives, as I did last week, because they just see themselves reflected there. Um, and it's quite hard to kind of give them something to hang on to, um, to make them feel why they should carry on with the course and why they should stay. Midwives with a disability, and as you remember, I said levels of self-reported disability were high. They were more vulnerable. And just clinical midwives in general compared with their colleagues in other um, areas of midwifery, such as research and academia, um, they were most vulnerable, particularly those who worked in situations where they were rotating, moving between areas, and where they worked in integrated settings where they were going between, so community midwives who were also staffing the labour ward or being called in to cover um, were also vulnerable. Next slide, please. But and I'm going to keep trying to focus on the positive here, um, and I, hopefully this will lead into um, some of the things that Steve's going to talk about later, about resilience. Um, but what supported midwives' mental health was supportive relationships with colleagues. It just stood out time and time again. These are the things that midwives reported, both in the survey data and, and there were some free text questions. This is what they said supportive relationships with colleagues, being able to give good quality care and love of the work. There's something about the work of being a midwife, the extraordinary work that midwives are engaged in, um, the passion that midwives feel, the ability to make a difference that keeps you going and keeps that balance between, you know, when the going is tough at work, but what keeps you going. And again, this will tap into um, some of the discussion about resilience, I'm sure. So next slide, please. So the qualitative data, we, we did analyse the free text data um, and Jo Carl, who's now a PhD student, she's a midwife in Croydon, but now doing her PhD with Sudan at UCLan. Um, she um, did some of the in-depth analysis with the qualitative findings, particularly looking at newly qualified midwives. But what we found um, was that the key themes were um, that came through their work, no surprises, quality, workload factors, quality of care factors, problems with the system, and then the positives, the importance of relationships and social support. And I've got a few quotes now on the next slides with some of the data. So next slide, please. So the workload factors, no surprises here. So staff shortages, not being able to get a break, difficult shifts and challenging work-life balance. And again, just keep remembering this is before COVID. So COVID has only exacerbated all of this, 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 this was our baseline, this is where we've started from, and then we had COVID for the staff to deal with. So um, this is a district general hospital midwife saying, I suffer from stress and anxiety due to workload, lack of staff and resources, I mean I'm stretched and I cannot give the care I want to to families. This is the bit that is so, it's like moral, moral injury, that sense of, I can't do the very thing that I came into the, the, the job, the, the profession to do. 
So I work 12 hour shifts, hardly ever get a break. I work over my hours, but I hardly ever get time back, for extra pay. And keep seeing services being cut back. And I feel like there are instances where women in my care are not safe due to a shortage of healthcare professionals. Next slide, please. Quality of care factors, so this sense of not being able to give that good quality of care, not being able to develop relationships with women, which we know from other research is so key um, to, um, to midwives to feel that they've done a good job. And this is all taps into, um, which I guess Trixie might talk about, but the uh, continuity of care at those schemes and, and what they can offer to women and to midwives. Um, and that mismatch between ideals and reality, which I've written about in some of my other studies of the emotional well-being of midwives. That, and this newly qualified midwife kind of sums it up really po poignantly, really, the feeling of failure when you're physically exhausted yourself and you co couldn't possibly do any more is demoralising. And above everything, not giving women and babies the care they deserve is the worst aspect. Next slide, please. And then the systems problems, it was really acknowledged that there were problems in the system. It wasn't, it shouldn't just be focused or it shouldn't be focused on individuals in any way. They're, the way that things are set up is not helping either. So there were certainly some issues with management um, that were coming through. There was a lot of crit criticism as, of management. We didn't have many managers, people of that level taking part. And it, it, that should be an important other next study really to kind of explore what um, what is happening there and what support is needed there and what their emotional stresses and strains are. And then there were institutional and systems problems. So this midwife on the left there says the lack of a shift pattern. So it was very haphazard. A lot of midwives said how challenging it was for work-life balance if you just don't get your rotors available on time. It makes you feel not valued as a, as a human being. You can't plan your own family life and childcare, short staffing, not providing high quality experience due to production line of work. Um, and that came up again and again, feeling that you were working on a kind of conveyor belt. Um, and then some criticisms of management here. Um, managers don't care, pay lip service only, unrealistic ex expectations from management, mentions of bullying and humiliation. And then this sense, I think, of, of being used to plug gaps in the service. Um, and again, before COVID, so, but midwives describe feeling like a bit of a thing. It's like, oh, well, can you just go there now? I know you were meant to be working in this area of the service, but we're short here, so just go there. And so, um, and midwives said, you know, that was very challenging for them personally, because in just in terms of how you have to prepare yourself mentally, but also often they didn't feel it was a very safe thing to do because they weren't um, uh, well prepared for where they were going or they didn't know much about the setup there. Next slide, please. I put this in a nice bright colour because I wanted to give you some good news because I'm very aware when I present this stuff that it just can make your feelings just go down like that. It just, because, because those other statistics and those other comments feel, are so negative. But what did shine through was um, the importance of collegial support and teamwork and this, the specialness of the job, which got referred to time and time again. So you can see some of the quotes here. This is what midwives said they, in, when they had a good day at work, these were the things that stood out for them. So simple enjoyment and love of the job, seeing women and families thrive, caring for my local community. And then really powerful comments about colleagues. So that, um, the things that stood out for these midwives that were the majority of their amazing colleagues trying to help each other out where possible. And I really like this quote from a newly qualified midwife about the awesome sense of humour and teamwork, even in the hardest clinical situations when our backs are against the wall. Clinical staff of all bands seem to pull it out of the bag, which is probably why the NHS hasn't collapsed yet. Credit to them all, which I'm sure will resonate with you, with you all. <laughs> Next slide, please. So I guess this, this is the interesting stuff is like, what, what can we do about all of this? Um, and we pulled out in this paper and, and the, the second qualitative paper that Joe Cole led on, um, and I'll give you some references at the end uh, coming up, but um, we kind of divided the, re the recommendations into things that could be done at an individual level and that we think there could be some quite quick 
fixes and the things that need to be done at a more meso or macro level. So regular breaks and refreshments and of course again COVID has really highlighted these. In fact I mean it sounds ironic doesn't it but I do think one of the positives that's come out of the um, out of the COVID-19 um, pandemic it has been this uh, increased awareness of the um, the emotional well-being of the healthcare work workforce in general. It's what I've been I mean I, I got my PhD in 20 years ago, but it's what I've been researching all my academic life as an academic midwife. And I've most of the time thought I've been banging my head against a brick wall or people thought I was talking about the, the pink fluffy stuff and not the, the stuff that really matters. And suddenly I felt that um, that people, because of COVID, people woke up. It's a shame it took a global pandemic for people to, to do that. But I do think that because of COVID, there is more attention to some of these things. So in terms of the individual level, being able to get your break, being able to go for a wee, being able to have a cup of tea. Um, and I know some trusts have just instigated things like people taking a turn to have to, to do the tea trolley, just to go around or to have a, a tea station, making sure that each other can just get out of the room for a minute. Um, if you're on labour ward, for example, um, and just getting that break. It's, it's Maslow's hierarchy, isn't it? We can't give good quality care if our bladder is bursting or if we're dehydrated or if our stomach is rough and eaten for eight hours. Um, this is very fundamental, I think, in all the literature around caring for the carers. Um, somebody's not on mute, aren't you? Um, I think it's that analogy, isn't Oh, can you, can you, Sorry, it's that analogy of like if you're on a plane and there's a problem, then you put on your own oxygen mask before you put on your child's. And, and it's back to that. We have to look after ourselves. We cannot give good care um, if we at least haven't got our basic physiological needs met. So another key recommendation that came out, and this is because of what midwives said to us, was that it makes a huge difference if you feel you have a, some at least some sense of agency that if you just feel like you're a thing that's being moved around, it, it's not um, it's not conducive to feeling good about yourself. It's not, um, it doesn't make you feel valued and respected. And it's not actually, it's not congruent with being, with being a professional um, and all the things that, you, all, all the work that you've done to train to get to that, um, that situation. So accommodation of off-duty preferences. I mean, it seems pretty basic, doesn't it? it it shouldn't be tolerated having, you know, if you've made a request because you have, have got a family event or whatever, that isn't taken, um, that, that isn't prioritised. Avoiding moving staff, not seeing is it something, oh, well, we could just move these here and these here, but actually having in your mind that that's an absolute last resort to do that. Supporting a good work-life balance. I mean, we could talk about that for hours, couldn't we? Because it links in with the previous point about off-duty, I think. But it's it's a really challenging one. It's easy to write down the words, much harder to achieve, as I'm sure we all know. I certainly know it myself. I think this next one is so key to how we move forward, is recognising the importance of teamwork. And not just tea, I think we kind of, it's a bit of a throwaway term, but the kind of bonding between members of the team, the attachment we have, watching it, getting each other's back like that in that quote. It's so important. It comes up time and time again in all studies of emotional well-being, in all healthcare staff, actually, but certainly with maternity staff. It's one of the, the things, it's the kind of social capital we've got here in our NHS that we can tap into and we didn't we see it during COVID. I know we're not through COVID yet, but in that really, the really critical times we saw it. Mm -hmm. So recognise the importance of that um, teamwork and bonding and collegial support and really nurturing that, find ways um, that we can nurture that in our workforce because it's precious, precious. Not all work um, working situations have that sense at all. They can be very competitive. It's not what we have in the NHS and we should be oh, celebrating it and valuing it absolutely and finding ways to nurture it further. And then we need additional proactive support, I think, for newly qualified midwives in terms of really making sure they get proper preceptorship. 
they can really have their um, keep their L plates on for a little bit longer um, and really feel supported. And also those with a disability as well. And people should be able to say that, that report that they have a disability rather than hiding it um, and thinking that they will somehow that's not an OK thing to share. Um, so on the on the, the broader level, the meso and macro level, um, you won't need me to say that we need some systems level changes in how maternity care is resourced and provided. And that would include looking very closely at the models of care that are on offer to, um, to so that midwives can work in models of care that are um, that, that tick all these boxes about what they find rewarding in their work um, and also give care to the women that is the care that the women themselves want. Um, and we know there's been masses of work gone on around this in, in the last few years. We also know we've had the big challenges of the various maternity reports, um, some of which have put various things on hold. Um, and I'm sure this will be talked about later. But I, th I think we need to be very mindful here about well, not going backwards. That's all I'm going to say. That I'm not going to get into a big debate. But um, we need and we have got pressure on the government to address workforce shortages. But I think retention is a big, big problem. And we're not going to be hang on to be able to hang on to staff unless we address some of these other issues. We can't. I mean, I I work in education. I see, you know, we, we spend seem to spend months <laughs> recruiting, getting the new students in, doing masses and masses of interviews for very few number of places. We recruit these young midwives who are so keen to become midwives, who so much want to do the job. We keep them going through their three, four years of training, and then then we find, you know, I meet some of them on the street and they have two years later they've decided to jack it in and it's so sad and often they're the ones who have who are most passionate about midwifery in the first place so uh leadership i think leadership's a really interesting one and i think what came through in some of the um responses in the survey was that that everybody is is keen to to um contribute to try and shape things and move things forward and so facilitating this sense of shared leadership that you're not just uh, somebody who's just receiving things from on high but this is a shared endeavor um, is, is very very important I know there's been some interesting work done, being done by um, a PhD student um, down in London but she has looked at um, how you can use like participatory to participatory action research to work, say, in a labour ward in a way that involves all the staff um, in terms of um, involving them in, in shared leadership of what is happening and, and valuing everybody's contribution, getting everybody's thoughts about what could move things forward. And again, it makes people feel valued and respected and heard, which is, is so important. There's certainly a need for managers, all managers. Managers need supporting. I mean, we were very aware that they were kind of the piggy in the middle quite often. They were having to deliver very unpalatable information to staff. Um, often we got the sense, but we didn't really hear from them very much, but it did feel like they probably were not getting the, the support that they needed. So all managers needing high quality management and leadership training. And the two things are not the same at all. And so there, as I mentioned before, I think that we need this research into managers' experiences and needs. And like, I guess maybe for me, perhaps the most important message, really, take home message is that we have got these existing really high levels of motivation that are still there. They're, they're there now, <laughs> talking to staff, certainly in my local hospital. You know, given everything everybody's still been has been through, there's still these very high levels of motivation, which you couldn't you couldn't go and buy it off the shelf. It's like this most you you, you can't put a a price on it. It's, it's invaluable, and we have to make the most of that. And um, really, I don't know. I don't avoid the word capitalize, but kind of optimize what that means for us as a profession, because we have got those still those high levels of motivation, but we need to be able to cultivate them. So next slide, I think I'm just about at the end now. 
Um, this was really nice. Well, after we pres pres the study findings came out and we had a report and then we had the uh, two papers published from it. Um, but I was very aware when doing some presentations initially, it was published, um, that people felt, I think that was end of 2018, it came out, but 2018-19, um, it felt like it was a very doom and gloom message. <laughs> and I was, I got to the point where I was sort of dreading um, going and speaking about it really. The RCM had a, this nice paper here, a Beyond the Whelm study, where they looked at what Oh, actually what different trusts were doing. Uh, this was in the RCM um, journal um, where, where various trusts reported on what they were actually doing as a positive response to Wilm. They did, people were not feeling completely defeated about it. And I had this lovely email just out of the blue from a clinical midwife that really meant a lot to me. So I wanted to share it because she said thank you to me personally for using your skills and position to study something so important. I think people don't feel so alone when they can see their work feelings are shared by others. The research combines and coordinates those feelings into a structure with recommendations for change. And I think that's a powerful thing. And for me as a researcher, I suppose that just ticked all my boxes about why I do the research I do and what I and the fact that I want to make a difference. Um, so, yeah. And I think just the final slide now is just to say thank you to everybody that took part. Oh, no, there's, there's the papers. So the first paper there is the one I was mentioning by Joe Cull overwhelmed and out of my depth. So that was looking at the worm study findings that were from early career researchers. Um, and further down, the other one with the blue highlight is the main study paper, um, which was published in Midwifery, which has all the kind of stats in. Um, also, just to highlight there that some of you may know I've done um, my other research has been around the opposite side of the coin, really, and looking at resilience. Um, so we did a small study myself and a colleague, uh, Lucy Warren, looking at midwives experience of workplace resilience, the descriptive qualitative study that was written up in Sudan and, um, and Sheena Byron's book, The Royal Behind the Star Silence as well. Um, but we've very recently had published, um, I'll just hold it up there, it's in The Practicing Midwife. It's just out, it was May this year, 2010, so 2022, and it's called Revisiting Resilience. And I'd really encourage you to find it. It's very readable. It's not a very, it's not an academic paper. Um, because what we've been picking up with, um, and I don't know whether Steve will talk about this as well, but there's been, um, we've been beginning to feel there was a lot of negative press around the word resilience, that people were, and people were kind of misinterpreting it and thinking it needed just kind of putting your armour on and toughening up and looking after yourself. So we, what we did in that um, paper was to look at, well, what is res resilience? Let's go back to it. And we have a table in it, which I think people have told us is really useful, where we've got, this is what resilience is, which is about self-compassion, which is about looking after your colleagues, which is about being flexible, self-aware, uh, developing self-compassion. Um, so that's what resilience is, and this is what resilience isn't, because it isn't about toughening up and just doing your work and going off and leaving everybody else to it, which we felt was beginning to be um, the message that was coming across about resilience. So final slide is a thank you, I think. Thank you. So that's just to say this was the, the team, myself and Josie Henley at Cardiff, the team from Australia that I mentioned, Mary and the two Jennies and Julie Pallant. Um, and the funding was from the Royal College of Midwives. And just that that's some of the, the um, Wellman collaborative that I mentioned from various countries. You can see the um, some of the Aussies with their red hats on, but also um, colleagues from Sweden and Norway. Um, and just to thank, event, um, you know, all of those midwives who took part in the original study, um, because it was so important to give us, you know, a robust uh, baseline for now how we can build on and try and improve things for midwives. So thank you very much, everybody. Billy, thank you for that. Uh, I think there's lots of things in there that will resonate with everybody and I think the conversation about resilience really resonated with me because we've just started to have it here and how the word resilience has kind of been twisted around to mean you just have to keep going and it's about doing more with the same and and it isn't that at all really is it and no. we've tried to certainly here at Airda we've tried to associate say associate it with the word recovery as well 
so that actually we put it back into that context mm. and how do we recover from where we've been what we've just been through what everybody's just been through for the last two and a half years so that's really helped me think yes we're on the right track and I'm sure and I hope that everybody takes that message away that when we talk about resilience we're not actually talking about just keep going just keep doing more that's not what it is so thank you so much for that I'm conscious of time and hopefully Billy are you staying with us for the morning I'm going to stay I'm going to stay for a little while I can't stay for the whole morning but I will stay for a little while and if if questions come up later Billy are we all right to contact you if there's anything comes up that we'd want to check out is that okay yeah absolutely of course I'd be delighted to thank you so much that was fantastic Abby I'm going to hand back to you thank you Amanda thank you Billy um so I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Some of you may have been expecting Jill Walton. Unfortunately, Jill Walton wasn't able to join us today, but Lynn Galvin, who is the regional head for the North of England RCM, um, has kindly stepped in and uh, and and taken um, taken Jill's place. Um, many of you submitted questions uh, for Jill, and Lynn has. Uh, prepared some answers to, to some of those questions and then we will do a bit of a Q&A afterwards and Trixie's going to help out with that because many of the questions that came in were related to continuity of carer. So I'll hand over to Lynn now. Thank you so much for joining us, Lynn. Thanks for stepping in. Thank you, Abby. Um, I, I did drop my Wi-Fi very briefly earlier on, so if I have any difficulties, I'll, I'll turn my camera off. But as it stands, fingers crossed for the next 20 minutes, I'll be OK. Um, it's really good to be here today and Jill does send her apologies. Unfortunately, she's on annual leave this week and she was going to do a, a pre-record for you, but then she was poorly when she was going to do the pre-record. So um, I was available, so I'm more than happy to come and talk to you. And I've prepared a presentation to answer the questions. But as Abby said, Trixie's joined us as well. Uh, so some of the continuity related questions would pro probably be better answered by her. So. Um, Maria, are you able to put the presentation up? Yes, of course. Thank you. You can go to the first slide. Thank you. So the, the, the question on the top of the list was, when are we going to get a pay rise? Um, and it's very timely because on the 19th of July, the government announced the pay award for NHS workers. Um, and that pay award is a £1,400 consolidated award. And that's across the board. So, so what that essentially means is that is a pay rise of 7.6% for the lowest paid NHS workers and a 1.3% rise for the highest NHS paid workers. Um, now, the government are telling you that the lowest paid workers are getting a 9% rise. They're not, they're getting a 7.6% rise. The reason they're saying 9% is because um, they uh, last year have had to give a 2% increase to those lowest paid workers because they weren't actually meeting the living wage. So um, it's a 7.6% rise for them. Um, the majority of RCM members um, will be getting a 4% pay rise. Now, the evidence that we gave to the pay review body was very clear that we wanted an inflation busting pay rise and 4% does not meet inflation, which is currently sat at 9.4%. So we don't believe that this is an adequate pay award for our members. And following the announcement, we emailed all of our members with a briefing that indicated that um, it's not acceptable and it won't do anything to stem the exodus from the profession. As Billy said in her presentation in 2018, 36% of those respondents were dissatisfied with pay. Um, we know that that's more now. Um, and we essentially need to hear the strength of feeling in order for us to take action. So um, the RCM board met yesterday and they have agreed that we go out to consult with our members. 
Now, the reason we are consulting with our members rather than immediately balloting our members is because the Trade Union Act was introduced in 2016. And the Trade Union Act says that we have to have a 50% turnout. So that's 50% of our members actually indicating um, on the uh, responding to the ballot. And we need 80% of those to indicate they want to take some form of industrial action. And we get one opportunity at that ballot. So we want to consult with our members first to actually gauge the strength of feeling. Now, if you are a member of the RCM and you did not get the email that came out on the 19th stroke 20th of July, then you need to update your membership details because that email went out to all members who have an email address registered with us and their preference is set for us to email them. So our advice is that please, please make sure that your membership details are up to date. Make sure they include your employer details, your email address and your postal address because the next steps are going to be requiring us to communicate with you and you to respond. Please spread the word amongst your colleagues and on social media and please respond when you get the consultation link sent to you. Um, it, it's in your hands, you need to indicate to us what you want to do next about this pay award. We say it's unacceptable, we absolutely agree with that. So please, please, please have your say. We've got 49,000 members. We'd like 49,000 responses, please. Next slide, Maria. So we also had a question on mileage. So when are we going to get um, a, a mileage payment that, that meets the, the cost of fuel currently? So um, we sit on the NHS Staff Council and that's where these um, matters are discussed. The government would not agree to a national increase in mileage payments. Um, now, the mechanism, mechanism for review of mileage payments was through Agenda for Change, but that was removed in 2016. So on an annual basis, the, the mileage payments would be reviewed in line with the recommendations from the AA. And that didn't just take into consideration fuel costs, that took into consideration the, the general upkeep of your vehicles. So because that was removed, we now don't have a annual mechanism of, of uplifting nationally. So what the RCM, together with the other health unions, have done via the NHS Staff Council is we've written to the Department of Health to request a review of the NHS mileage scheme in the hope that we can adopt some kind of a regular review so that we're not ever in this position again. Now, Scotland and Wales across the board have temporarily increased their mileage payments by five pence. We know that local organisations can individually uplift mileage payments themselves. And the way that that would happen would be through negotiation through the JNCC mechanisms in those organisations. Um, we know that some organisations have increased their mileage payments temporarily by 10 pence. Some some have done it by, you know, five pence, um, but there are some moves to make these increases. Um, we are indicating that um, organisations should maybe look at other options as well, maybe receiving fuel, maybe providing fuel cards, looking at public transport travel passes, hire cars, or maybe even investing in pool cars for community teams. Um, um, maybe thinking about paying travel expenses weekly rather than monthly um, because we're paying them in arrears. So essentially we are having to foot the bill first before we get compensated for that. And what was brought to my attention was that our maternity support workers working in the community are often the ones who are doing the most mileage. They're the lowest paid workers, but they're doing the most mileage because they're the ones that are going out doing the breastfeeding support and, you know, going out filling the gaps where the midwives aren't, aren't uh, uh, going out. So um, that was a really, really interesting piece of information that I think we would be feeding back in. 
So I would advise that um, you contact your local RCM reps about what talks are going on in your trust uh, and make sure that it is on the agenda at the JNCC. Next slide, Maria. So one of the questions was about uh, women that choose to free birth. Um, now, very recently, we produced our care outside of guidance um, document and that went together with our informed decision making documents. So they are very, very recent publications and they can be found on the website. Um, and we've very recently done a webinar as well that talks around these two documents. And that's available on the on the website if you want to go and have a look at that um, webinar. Um, we absolutely appreciate that this can be difficult for midwives where women are choosing to birth outside of guidance. Um, and that there might be a personal conflict between your duty of care and the wishes of the woman in, in your care. Um, it, often the perception of risk varies and midwives might have to negotiate their professional concerns sensitively while providing that um, compassionate care. Um, please, please, please have a look at the documents. They are really, really useful, really helpful in supporting you in these decisions. Next slide, Maria. Um, so very fitting with um, Billy's uh, um, update on the WELM study. So Caring For You was a campaign that we launched in 2016. And, and the majority of organisations had their heads of midwifery signing up to our Caring For You charter. Um, and lots of organisations were really, really good at producing care packages and providing the day to day support like bottled water um, uh, and uh, fresh fruit for midwives on on duty um, to support their well-being in the workplace. We decided, um, having been through the COVID pandemic, that we needed to refresh Caring For You. So we have revisited the charter and reproduced it. The, the commitments are essentially the same, but we've we've kind of reworded them and strengthened them. And we've made it clear now that it isn't literally just the health and safety rep who has this responsibility in the branch. This is a whole branch partnership with your head of midwifery and your HR department to support your well-being in the workplace. Now, the charter commitments have been changed slightly, but we're still looking at culture, promoting a positive, inclusive culture where staff feel valued, respected and invested in. Um, we, we feel that the action plans now need to be reality. So they were a bit of a paper exercise previously. They weren't often completed. They weren't often revisited. But we want real partnership with these action plans now between the branch and HR and the head of midwifery to make sure that they're bespoke, that they're, they're tailored to that workplace. At what are the issues in that workplace affecting the well-being of staff? And, and you know, how are we going to address them together? So looking at the responsibility, looking at health and safety strategies to present to prevent damage to staff well-being and making sure we've got zero tolerance of violence, aggression um, and that you're committed to providing a safe and healthy working environment. Making sure that you're inclusive, implementing actions to address inequality in the workplace to ensure incl inclusivity and protect staff from bullying, um, incivility and all negative and undermining behaviours. So a really important commitment there. Nurturing a positive experience for all new starters. So not just newly qualified midwives, but returners to the service and promote attractive and innovative shift patterns, which will be easily accessible to midwives and, and maternity support workers. And working in partnership to monitor and evaluate the progress. So have a live action plan, revisit it, update it, add to it, you know, really, really make this a meaningful document. Next slide, Maria. So um, one of the questions was about um, support for, for newly qualified midwives. 
Um, we have recognised from our membership statistics that we do lose student midwives at the point of qualification and we lose newly qualified midwives at the point of conversion into full membership, which is after 12 months. So we recognise that they're not going to other unions, they're actually leaving the profession. And so we have um, done a piece of work that looks at how we can provide more support for midwives in their early careers. And we're developing a bespoke package for our members. We've done focus groups where we've spoken to third year student midwives and newly qualified midwives and some midwives up to five years of qualification. And we're going to tailor this package up to the point of the first revalidation. So the first three years of qualification. And we're developing a, a specific hub on the website for early career midwives where we're going to put our resources that are specific for the support for them. Um, we're going to develop a support network via our, our iLearn platform where early career midwives across the country can come together to, to support each other, discuss what their concerns are and interact with each other and get that level of support. We're producing a guidance document on preceptorship. So we already have a position statement on preceptorship that we're just currently updating. So it's not about what preceptorship is, but it's it's about, you know, what to expect from your preceptorship. Basically, a kind of a how to guide what should happen, what shouldn't happen and how to get the best support in that preceptorship period. We're developing some culture workshops that are specifically tailored to midwives in the first year of qualification, second year and third year. And looking at, you know, in the third year, looking at them developing into an autonomous practitioner, a leader in that organisation. And so we are looking at leadership development specifically in that third year. Um, and we're, we're providing dedicated support in the workplace from local RCM branch learning reps. So we're going to develop that role so that the learning rep is the person in the organisation who meets with these early career midwives, um, welcomes them to the branch, welcomes them to the organisation and is that kind of key person who can provide some extra support in the workplace um, to, to them in their early career. Next slide, Maria. So con continuity of carer. So I will touch briefly. I know Trixie is going to follow me um, with the um, NHSE's updated position. Um, so uh, the RCM's position on continuity care of carer has been unchanged. So. In 2014, we produced a document that was called Getting the Midwifery Workforce Right. And we indicated in that document in 2014 that to provide continuity, we would need to have the right numbers of midwives in the workplace. Um, in 2018, we produced our position statement, which talked about ring fencing, um, funding for, for continuity of carer, and that there needed to be the correct staffing in place and that they needed the tools to work safely in this model. We have over the years produced a number of documents um, um, to, and materials to support the implementation of continuity of carer. So we've produced the guidance documents around, you know, shift patterns, pay, pensions, on call, rosters. We did the what if series that looked at how do maternity support workers work in continuity teams? How do I do my roster? You know, how, how does it work in reality? Um, and the nuts and bolts document is the one where we talk about your your rights as an employee and how your pay should not be affected. Um, and what does it mean to do on call? So all of that is embedded within those documents that we've produced. We produced the continuity counts game that actually demonstrated how a roster might work with a given caseload, 36 women, um, and plotting that on a month chart to see in reality, how many births am I going to have in that month? How many antenatal visits am I going to have to do in that month? 
um, and, and what other um, commitments will I have and what time will it take? So we've produced a lot of resources. Um, our further position that was produced in 2020 talked about the building blocks. It talked about staff training. It talked about numbers of staff and it, it talked about, you know, getting it right before you move forward with any continuity models. And that's been our position all along. I think what we're finding is that where organisations are doing um, organisational change processes in order to implement continuity, our members are feeding back to us that they have div difficulty with work-life balance in uh, a flexible continuity model. And I know that sounds strange, but I, this is what our members are feeding back to us. They seem to prefer set shift patterns. They seem to be preferring a set area of work. Um, uh, that's the feedback that we're getting and where, where const, uh, uh, organisational change processes are being um, uh, done, that's the feedback that we're giving. Um, their personal lives for many reasons don't fit with a continuity model. Um, we appreciate that in some organisations there are um, teams that are, are um, focusing on the most vulnerable women and they have successes with that and they've got um, small pockets across the country of um, continuity teams that are working. Um, but the feedback from our members it is in the main that, that they have some difficulty with it. Now, our difficulty is that we're coming out of the pandemic that it's really difficult where we've got an exhausted workforce and we've got depleted numbers. Um, we've got members who are telling us, I'm 55, I can't do continuity, I'm going to retire. You know, we've, we've got the newly qualified midwives who um, in the main have been really positive about continuity, but then what support are they getting in the workplace where the numbers are short and you know are they getting the right support in order to to move into those models so basically the rcm are going to continue to influence at national regional and local level to make sure that solutions are found to resolve the concerns that are being raised with the implementation of continuity of carer and to make sure that the plans for further rollout have safe staffing levels in place with a sustainable workforce plan moving forwards. And where the foundational building blocks are not yet in place for implementation of the full pathway, the RCM would recommend seeking to increase the level of midwifery continuity provided in the antenatal and postnatal periods. All women, whatever mod the model of maternity care, must receive continuous one-to-one -one support from a midwife throughout active labour. So we're going to continue to work locally to influence working practice practices to ensure that all midwives and maternity support workers have appropriate pay, working conditions and appropriate home life balance to enable them to deliver safe midwifery care to all. Next slide. Maria? Um, so um, if we look, the numbers of midwives working um, is lower now than at the point of the last general election. We're seeing a year on year fall in midwives. We lost 600 midwives to the profession last year. In 2021, the RCM survey showed that over half of midwives are considering leaving the profession. And in our HOMS survey, 77% of HOMS told us that they're having difficulty recruiting Van 6 midwives. Um, the NHS staff survey showed us that only 6% of midwives think there are enough staff in their unit and 83% work unpaid hours and 71% reported in the NHS staff survey that they're exhausted. But midwives and maternity support workers continue to give good care, but that's often at the detriment of their own health and their own safety. Uh, the RCM will continue to raise um, what Donna Ockenden said, that the government should implement the Health and Select Committee recommendation to increase funding for maternity services by £350 million. 
Without this funding, services are going to continue to struggle. And, you know, we would ask organisations to seriously look at retention, look at applying flexible working principles from Agenda for Change, look at trying to correct the differences in bank incentives. You know, we're finding that midwives are not prop not not doing extra shifts in your service if your neighboring service is paying an extra bank incentive they're gonna go there think about you know as an lmns can we have a bank incentive that's agreed across the whole patch to stop this movement of staff to keep the staff in your own service you know all student midwives qualifying in september should be being employed we've heard that some student midwives are not being offered posts how can that be when we have got a shortage of midwives student midwives are completing a three-year course in order to access the course they're educated at a level they're completing the course being supported by midwives in organizations passing the course they're going to be on the nmc register why are they not employable at the end of their course we need to seriously think about why we're not giving all of these newly qualified midwives jobs in today's climate Sorry, Next Lynn, slide. just a quick heads up just we're, we're running slightly behind schedule um that's my last slide that's great thank you <laughs> Okay, okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I you, you used my platform. Sorry, Abby. And um, so, so just, just what, what else the RCM are doing? Because often we get, what do the RCM do for me? So all of what I've just told you, the RCM are fighting on your behalf. But these pieces of work are also what we are doing. So reactive is a new piece of work that we've started to look at reinvigorating our branches, getting branches more active, getting people collectively coming together in the workplace, talking about what the issues are for them. ABC is our avoiding um, brain injury and childbirth piece of work that we've collaboratively been doing. Um, and that's looking at fetal monitoring guidance and looking at um, guidance on uh, dealing with impacted fetal skull. Rebirth is the a piece of uh, work that we did producing the report that looked at the language that we use during childbirth, looked at what women's views were on and how we talk about their birth. We're doing a lot of work around Ockenden. Donna Ockenden gave us three pieces of work that she wanted us to do. So we're, we're um, starting to think about how we do those pieces of work. Um, I am the RCM's representative um, on the NHS Pension Scheme Advisory Board, where we are the I am the voice there of, of how your pension is changing and how it is affecting you. We will still consider to continue to celebrate IDM on an annual basis celebrate our um, MSWs and our student midwives and we will continue to challenge racism in the workplace through our Race Matters work. And just one final plug, RCM conference, first face-to-face -face conference in two years, 4th and the 5th of October in Newport. It's free to RCM members and we're going to be looking at a theme of recover, reflect and renew. Please get booked on. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Lynn. Um, OK, I'm just conscious of time, Abby. Where are we with the agenda? Thank you, Lynn. Um, so we have got a few slides with some questions for Lynn and Trixie to answer together because they, some of them were more apt for RCM, some were more apt for NHS England. However, I'm aware that Trixie's got a presentation, so I don't know if Trixie, if you want to go ahead and share your presentation and then we can do a little bit of Q&A at the end if we've got time before the break. Yeah, should we do that then? I will hand over to you, Trixie, to introduce yourself. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks very much, Abby, and thanks everybody for um, taking time out to listen to all of us. And what a privilege it's been to particularly listen to Billy Hunter, who has influenced my career more than I can say, Billy. I hope you're still here and you've heard me say that. 
because it's absolutely true. I've spent most of my midwifery career thinking about how we can how we can get this right for for everybody. Um, I'm just going to share my screen with you and um, hopefully address some of your concerns that uh, Lynn in particular has raised. Now I'm I'm going to have it in this setting just because I think it'll be easier for um, it's easier for me to still see all of you and the and the chat at the same time as we as we go through this. So as you'll be aware, I'm Trixie Mackery. I'm the National Lead for Continuity of Carer. And um, what I'm going to talk to you about is not surprisingly continuity of carer. But bearing in mind this is a workforce event, what I've really done is try to focus on the issues that concern the workforce in particular. So I am going to talk about the other bits just ever so slightly because we have to hold everything in context because we have to think, well, why are we doing this and keep our eye on the big picture, which is of course to impact health outcomes. But we're also doing this because our current systems are very questionable. So if we just move into our context to start with, we have had almost 20 years of being in the spotlight with not just midwifery staffing, but with um, NHS staffing as well. And yeah, um, you, you, you'll remember we had Northwick Park, we've had Morecambe Bay, we've had, um, we've had Midstaffs, we've had Basildon, we've had East Kent and we've had Ockenden, just to let name a few things. And what that tells us absolutely categorically is the current way we deliver care absolutely does not work. There's no two ways around this. I was actually at Northwick Park when it went into special measures. That's where I actually met Billy, who I think that's when you must have got your PhD because I went in as a, a little F grade research midwife and um, listened to your presentation on um, the emotional work of midwives and bang, that impacted me so much. You don't know, you can't imagine how much that influenced me. But though those issues that came up at Northwick Park are exactly the same ones that came up at Morecambe Bay that have come up in Ockenden. It's about culture, it's about feeling competent, it's about care planning, it's about risk assessment. I, in those days, as, as that person, even though that wasn't my job, I went round giving seminars on how do you do care planning, how do you do choice and personalisation. I know, I think it's you, Joel, have got the responsibility of delivering the choice and personalisation. If we carry on with the way we're doing it, we will not achieve any of those things. We have to say the current system is broken for all the things we've rehearsed. We've got evidence to say why and how we should change. And if we think about solutions, continuity makes sense. I know I can't think of another way of um, changing our current service delivery system than doing the things we're doing. And we've also got as well the shocking embrace reports that say poorer outcomes are, uh, with black, Asian and mixed ethnicity women. So we've got this perfect storm of everything not being right. And therefore we have to say, right, we're going to stop review, which is what happened with the better births and say, well, what can we do about this instead? There is a way out. It's not all doom and gloom. We have to think, well, what are we going to do? And the first thing is we need to agree our vision. But the second thing is for all of us is that we have to agree to think differently about the problem, because as Uncle Einstein, as I like to refer to him, <laughs> has said many times, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting the same results. And I remember, so I was a, a young head of midwifery or an old head of midwifery in 2014-ish uh, when Francis came out. And for a little window of time, we were allowed to get enough staff and we brought them in. Did it fix everything? I don't know that it did. So I think staffing is absolutely crucial to all this. And please don't go away and say, Trixie said we don't need more staff because that's not right. We absolutely do. But that isn't the total answer to our problems. We have to take the evidence that we've got and we've got to use our evidence wisely to say, well, how do we change this? How do we fix this? And um, all the evidence that I'm pulling from, it's not just evidence around continuity of care, it's also from anthropology, from global health, from primary care, and, and, and all, the other, or all the other spaces that we can be aware of. Now, of course, we know that we don't just have one Cochrane review, we have three Cochrane reviews that tell us if you give all three elements of care, you change the outcomes. And specifically for women who are deprived or um, uh, in, in, in areas of, of, of social uh, difficulty, 
But I want to point out a couple of uh, pieces of evidence that you won't probably be so aware of on this particular in this particular space. And that is the work that Anthony Costello's done in the Indian subcontinent. He put in place, and I've put it's, it's a whole raft of pieces of research, but you can go and find it, or you can ask me for the the reference uh, if you want to. But what he did was he tried to do all these clinical interventions to save babies and mothers' lives, and they didn't work. And I've met him, I've had coffee with him, and he's explained it to me. It's really the truth. And he's talking. We're talking about thousands of babies dying. We're talking about thousands of mothers dying. He put in place a relational intervention. And that changed the outcomes. The other one I want to talk to you about, which I think is really, really relevant, and it didn't even happen in maternity services, is Kai et al. Uh, Joseph Kai is, is um, the professor of primary care at Liverpool University, and he was looking at why we make mistakes with people of, who are different to us. And he was looking at ethnicity. And his research said that even when we want to do the right thing for somebody, because we don't have a relationship with them and they look different, we make the wrong assumptions and therefore we miss, we miss, we miss what's wrong and therefore we make mistakes. And that contributes to the higher level of um, black and Asian women uh, dying than, than other people. The other thing I want to draw on is, is Michael West's work. Um, he has spent a humongous amount of time studying what works in terms of workforce and, and his conclusion over all the years, and the first time I heard him speak actually was at the RCM conference in 2004, he said, if you make people work in meaningful teams, you will change outcomes, you will stop clinical error, you will get people to come to work, and um, and people will be happy whilst they're at work. Now, all those things, that is, that is really significant, because at the moment our sick rates are high now, some of that of course is COVID and we can't do anything about it, but some of it is that you'll see unhappy services with very high sick rates anyway. And where, for example, I've got examples of where continuity is working well, their sick rates reduce because they're happier at work and they will report to you that they're, they're working happier, not sadder. And I'll address one of the issues that, um, that, 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 that Lynn has raised to us. Now, I'm also going to just mention this little last one here, a piece of little piece of research that I did when I was setting out on my research journey. And I was looking at how doctors and midwives tell the difference between pathological and transient blood pressure rises. It was before we had the nice guidance come out. And what they all said to me was, if I know a woman, I can tell when she's getting ill. That is quite a fascinating finding. And that tells us that if we reorganise the way we deliver our services, uh, we, we stand a chance to make some really significant gains in outcomes. And then the final one, and this is about proper continuity, is do women want it? Yes, they do. And when we reviewed the 2019 CQC survey data, we could say that women that received continuity with all three elements significantly experienced 38 of 42 items were better. So that tells us that's important. But just to clarify, because I think one of the issues that has come up again over and over again is what have we been asked to do? And there's some really interesting models where people have come out with some really interesting things and then they wondered why it didn't work. And what we're saying is in the context of relationship, if we want to make a difference in someone's life, we're asking a midwife to pick that woman up at booking and provide a context and a model and a mechanism that allows that midwife to walk with the woman all the way through her pregnancy journey till she's discharged the health visitor but because we recognise that on its own would be onerous, we don't say it's wrong. We're very happy if we want to do that pure caseloading model. But what we say is for out of hours air care, you um, you take turns with your um, with, with your team and therefore you also set in, in motion mechanisms that mean that the women can know your team. And if you work in a completely different way, this is really easy. And I've got very good examples where that works um, exceptionally well. But we don't want midwives working in silos. That came up again in, in Ockenden and in other and in uh, um, the Morecambe Bay report. What we want to say is we are a multidisciplinary team. We are doing this together. And when you set this work up in a new way, you also have to set up new relationships with your obstetricians. And so what we've suggested is that every team has a linked obstetrician. That obstetrician is not responsible for those women, but the obstetrician has a relationship with those midwives and sometimes the women. This allows for a strong ethos that allows for fresh eyes and it actually allows for a microcosm of clinical governance. So you've got your, let's say, seven midwives responsible for 252 women. 
they are now autonomous and Michael West tells us anybody that's autonomous at work is generally happier. They're empowered to take actions and as they follow that through, they take their data. So Amanda, who I can see right in front of me as the chief nurse, is delighted because she knows that woman in Keithley or wherever she happens to be is getting top notch care because she's got the she's got the clinical governance data from that team. And it's not fudged. It's not nonsense. And she has a total helicopter view as to what's happening into our services because we've organized this into a way that's meaningful and will work. But it's not just about the teams, it's about the whole service thinking about how they deal with it differently. So practically and actually intentionally, everybody from the top down is delivering continuity, whether you're in a team or not. Now, there are key elements that we can see that make this work. So when I started my journey on continuity, I was ahead of midwifery 2016 and, and um, I was quite I, I agreed with continuity, I have to say, but I was sceptical as to how it was going to work. I had 500 staff. I had no idea how I would in in my wildest dreams organize all these people. It was going to be really complicated. And then I became a professor at BCU and I started teaching us and I was really loosey goosey. Oh, just do what you want to do. And I have learned through three years of going to service after service after service and discussing it endlessly with everybody. There are only a few ways you can do this and make it work large scale. So it's very easy, as Lynn alluded to, you'll have this team over here, that individual over there, they are able to make a difference because you've only got an individual or you've got three people doing something on their own over there, very bespoke. What we're talking about is significant service, high look, um, large scale change. And therefore, whatever you do has to be really simple. It has to be really uniform so it can happen across a service. And therefore, to do that, autonomous, flexible working is the way to do it. And the, for the majority, that's mixed risk geographical teams with um, for, for large tertiary referral centres in particular, uh, maybe maternal medicine med team or two. And that using that model allows the right dotage of relationship. Um, and it then hits the button of being able to do personalised care and support plans. If you are booking 42 women a year, if your attrition rate is 15 percent and you are therefore birthing 36 women a year, your life caseload is 27. It means that without a shadow of a doubt, every single woman you care for is going to have an absolutely outstanding, sparkling, brilliant, personalised care and support plan because you will have time to do that. Whereas when you're doing the traditional model where it might be in the region of 120 women you're looking at and you're frazzled and all over the place, you will not be able to do that, even with the best will in the world. It's because we haven't set the system up right to make that work for people. Continuity also, by the way, addresses the Ockenden findings, whether you're talking about bereavement in the latest uh, version or I actually wrote this slide when, when we still had the 2020 version where you've got teams that talk to each other and function well, you'll have good organisational culture. What I know from Shrewsbury and Telford, because I've been told by the midwives there, is they were too scared to come out of the delivery rooms or they were too scared to ask for help because of the bullying culture. If you want to stop that happening, you have to change the dynamic that you have in your service and having good teams will do that. And it will also allow for the care planning and the risk assessment. And it will also allow for very good um, multidisciplinary team working. So I can't go on without talking about um, the, Ocken, the latest Ockenden review. And clearly, it doesn't take a PhD to tell you that you have to have the right staff. If you have a service with the wrong number of staff in, in it, whether that's nurses, doctors, physios, <laughs> midwives, your service is, no, is not right. It's probably unsafe. And that will go regardless of the model of care. So actually, continuity isn't making services unsafe. The fact that we don't have enough midwives or we don't have enough of the other things also makes it unsafe. So we've got we've got the we've got the Ockenden uh, document saying, well, you have to think about this. And then you've got you've had the letter from Amanda Pritchard. Thank you. That's my morning coffee coming uh, that also um, addresses this. But then what we also have to understand is that on the back of that, particularly in relationship to the newly qualified midwives that I know concerns people, the NMC sent out two absolutely fantastic letters one to the students and one to, to one to leaders that tells us what we should be thinking. And we should be still making sure our students train in continuity models when we expect them to come out with that. And we need to provide the evidence 
uh, and they need to they need to be working with this because it's a standard. So that's so so they've come out and said, and they've also come out and said, well, those people are, are coming out as qualified people. So we have all this context. Then what happened was the um, maternity transformation uh, team sent out a guidance note on the sixth of. May as well, and it explained this further. And there was a webinar which which I spoke out that had this information in it too. So so all that to say, we carry on. So then, how do we know that our staffing is safe? Because this is the crux of our problem, isn't it? How many staff do we know need? So at the moment, most people use birth rate plus uh, methodology, and it's based on activity and um and, and acuity and that tells you what your midwife to um, woman ratio should be um and they also consider you know they so they look at the skill mix and and so on and so forth they don't tell us where to deploy our staff although they often give us an idea what we know from the king's fund is they reviewed staffing way back when in 2011 they did another paper in 2014 which i haven't referenced here but they've looked at staffing and they've said actually we don't really know what the right number should be and then turner again looked at it in 2021 and said we still need a better evidence base. And so there is work that most people won't be aware of, but there's work going on in the background at a national level that are looking at how do we get this right and how do we take what we already know with Birth Rate Plus and build on it. And of course, the final uh, commentary on all, the, all of this is that we need to bring in our professional judgment as leaders. So where does that leave you? Well, first of all, we have to carry on using our standard accountability processes. So our biannual board papers, um, we, 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 we keep our systems and processes that we've got in place that say whether our staffing is safe or not at the moment in any case. And then we triangulate that with our incidents, complaints, com compliments and so on and so forth. And we also work with our key bodies. So we've got all those mechanisms in place. But as we know, they haven't worked as well as they should have done because most services, as again, as Jill has said, do have uh, gaps in their staffing. So we need to go back to our baseline of what we've reported and said, was our service safe? And that's the way how you make a decision as, as to whether you're safe to have your teams and to continue with your teams. So you go back to your board paper and say, did I tell my board my service was safe? And, and if it's a yes, then you can carry on with your teams. If you said, no, it's not safe, well, you shouldn't have rolled out teams in the first place. And that's, you know, that's work that should have happened pre uh, rolling out teams. Um, at the moment, we're still with birth rate plus. So Ockenden has said to review this and that is underway. But at the moment, it's the best practice and the best methodology we have. So we are recommending as, as, as a national team that people carry on doing that. So and then the final thing you have to say is, has there been any recent changes? To, has a lot of people suddenly disappeared for reasons that we don't know? you know, maybe retirement or whatever. Now, if you think you have an issue and your service is in this position, your first decision should be a board level decision because this is really serious. If you've had teams in place and you want to stop them, you need to you need to know why. And it needs to be not a decision that's made in isolation. You should have used the modelling tool or equivalent, the NHSEI modelling tool to de determine the impact of suspension. Because actually, in many, many cases, it won't it won't make your staffing any safer. It won't make it better. It won't make it worse. And it won't it will just move the women around. And so you'll be in a worse position or, or, or in, in, in a no better position if you stop your teams. And I think that's really, really important to understand. You need to understand the maths that sits underneath this. And I. I wasn't going to go into this level of detail for this presentation today, but actually I have put a couple of slides to show you the maths because I think actually if you know it's not all bonkers and there's a, there's a really clear uh, process, it will help everybody understand what it is we're trying to do and, and say here. The other thing to think about is we, we the, so the national team have said carry on with your band fives until there is further uh, advice. So that might be that it still carry on or, or there might be something else that comes up that I can't tell you about yet because I don't know it. But at the moment, the advice is carry on working with your band fives in the same way as you are. So if they're in, if they're in the community, they can carry on. If they're in continuity teams or you're about to put them into continuity teams, you can carry on. We have research that says the band fives that work in the continuity teams, going back to Billy's work, um, tells us that. Um, that they have a far far better time of it they complete their competencies quicker and they are um 
they yeah, they do much, much better basically when they're in teams. And actually the other thing to talk about this, which sort of fits with the whole realm study, is that um that midwives working in teams uh, do better because they're happy about what they do. They don't have that dissatisfaction at work that we have when we work shift systems. So shift the 12 hour shift is actually the crux of the problem, I would say, in, in, in much of this. And if we can get away from that, we will do this. So we have to think about the clinical risk of suspension on safety, personalization and also staff well-being. So I know a service that when Ockenden came out, thought, oh, dear, we better stop our teams. They had six teams in play and immediately the six teams, which involved about 40 midwives or so, um, all said, well, if you stop our teams, we're going to resign. And therefore that you would have been in a worse position regardless of anything else. And then when we worked with that service, we were able to demonstrate it would absolutely not have improved the template in any way. And I will demonstrate that to you in a minute. And then the final one to bear in mind is the impact on the equity. Uh, processes because if you take this away you're you're going against the equity act because you're actually um you're now uh, enhancing the health in inequalities rather than reducing them so let's think about how this works in reality so i'm going to show you this first slide that tells you this is a two-sided service it's darlington and durham it's not a million miles away from you but this pink the pink is one side and the blue is the other side now this was this snapshot of time which was between November and March 21 they didn't have any staffing issues in particular it was just bog standard and they looked at this that their staffing and what they could see is that perfect staffing this one here where my cursor is moving was only 20 percent of the time having too many people in the house was all of this time not having enough people in the house was this time and therefore you can see it's a highly uneven model of care. So to explain this further, I, when I was a head of middle free, I had 22 births a day in my service. But in reality, that could have been 16 births or 33 births or any other number you care to choose in between. And therefore, knowing that I needed 15 people on my service didn't make, you know, it, it, it was like you, it, it could be the right number, it might not be. It was all a bit of a lottery. Now, if we change the way we deliver care to stop staffing a building, but instead staff the women, you suddenly have a very safe service because every single woman has a midwife who's going to appear in the interpartum space with her, and therefore that service is going to be much, much safer. And of course, you're going to keep the core team. So ultimately, what that looks like is this. You still have a core, and each service will have a different quantity of midwives and everybody else left in the court, you still have your specialists, which would include your include your obstetricians. But the majority of the midwives are in these teams. Some might be maternal medicine or they might just be in mixed risk geographical teams. Each have a relationship with an obstetrician. And then you've got a band seven oversight, probably over about four teams. It's up to you. But that's how it looks like as it's finished. And this is this is just explaining what the team looks like. So the green midwife is the newly qualified. The orange person is the MSW. But we're also within the teams, we are looking at career progression by allowing um, each midwife to develop their own speciality. So, for example, in Bradford, there's a home birth team. Now, they may well want to sit in a mixed risk geographical team, but they also retain their own own identity as a home birth set of experts. So you maintain that is their interest, that is their expertise. They maintain that and they maintain their relationship with each other. But actually, as you roll out the teams, you may say, well, we're going to put the people in different teams so that the rest of the midwives can benefit from that expertise too. And actually, then it makes the whole service runs well because with uh, home birth teams in particular, you know that it's a 60% drop off. That means that um, you will not be able to provide continuity to most of your women when you do it that way. So the tw so if you booked 60 women, 40 will drop out for all sorts of reasons, 20 will remain. What are you going to do with that other 40? You now have a whole new logistical problem trying to sort them out and um, you only end up with 40. So you can't control your flow. So that's just um, one example of how, how this works. So any service you're talking about, you need foundations, don't you? You can't just run a service and, and, and you just expect people to turn up at work and you don't have any infrastructure around them. What's really important is that you you know what your staffing is, and I've talked about that a lot. You need to make sure your staff are a tree, uh, um, 
are um, trained appropriately with their clinical expertise, but also things like team building and education. You can't just wake up one morning and say, oh, hello, we're all going to be um, we're all going to be autonomous and expect everybody to know what that means and how to do it. Therefore, you've got to build into your planning, uh, team building and education around that. You need your linked obstetrician. You need to have done your communication and your engagement. You need to have done your spreadsheet. That is absolutely crucial. You've drawn out what this is going to look like long term, and I will show you that in a minute. And then the final one, well, of the key ones is the standard operating policy. So. You wouldn't do anything else in your service without a standard operating policy and and continuity is no different. You need to lay down roles and responsibilities, who's doing what, when. And this also includes your escalation policy. So what we know is in services that had rolled out continuity and they did it exactly as described, the midwifery, the midwives sick rates significantly dropped. But sadly, because of COVID and Omicron in particular, that's when it all started to go a bit wrong, was they suddenly would called in on escalation. This should not happen. Your continuity midwife has done her day's work in the same way as your postnatal midwife has done her day's work, in the same way as your antenatal clinic midwife's done her day's work, and so on and so forth. None of us knew. So when I wrote my escalation policy way back in the in the early teens, I never dreamed that there would be a pandemic that would wipe out our staffing and cause all these difficulties. All of us, if we're in a leadership position, need to go back and review our escalation policies because that is the thing that is making, making it difficult for midwives to deliver continuity. So people understand that if I'm a delivery suite midwife, let's say, I'm likely to do three nights. I know when they are. I know when I'm going to be doing them. I know when I'm going to come to the hospital. It's all controlled. Now, if I'm a continuity midwife, I know I'm going to do three births and I can actually control a year in advance if I want to when I'm going to be doing those on calls or those birth availabilities. You do not do extra hours. If you're a full time person, you do 37 and a half hours. But you you and your team agree between yourselves when you're going to do the out of hours work. And so, you know, you plan your childcare or you plan your life around that in exactly the same way as you would do. Within, within the context of, 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 of I'm on the delivery suite and I'm going to be doing a delivery suite shift. There's no difference in, in predictability or all the rest of it. It's it's just very slightly different in, in, in the amount of flexibility required. But then the rest of the time, because of your caseload is now manageable, you have a much easier life and you have a much, much better work-life balance. The stuff that, that, that Billy was talking about, you're looking after a proper number of women, you know you've done a good job. Back in the in, in COVID, in, in the worst times of COVID, I went back to my old trust and I worked clinically. Now, I said I would only do an early and and by good fortune, several times it's happened to me. The woman came in and I said to the girls, I'm going to love this baby out. And we did. And I had the most fantastic time with the woman in the pool doing what we did, had a birth, even discharged her before I went home. And it was fantastic. I know there was a bit of luck involved in all of that, but that's that's how it went and I went home as high as a kite because I'd had a fantastic time I even got a thank you letter everything was brilliant now if you said to me Trixie you've just done that great care for that woman now repeat it all over again please for the next woman that's come in the door what I will tell you categorically is that second woman would get really short shrift for me because I gave my heart, I gave my brain, I gave my body, I gave everything to woman number one. And, and I had a fantastic time doing it and I was doing exactly as I was qualified and trained to do. If I did it with a second woman, I would be now tired and, and unable to do it. And that is the rub with our current services and doing the 12 hour shifts and all the rest of it. If we set up this properly, nobody is tired and everybody can give care in a way that's appropriate with an appropriate workload and a much easier way uh, of managing this. Um, pay is another key um, building block that needs to be addressed. And, and, and uh, you can read about that in the guidance. We won't have time to go through it. All. We have done what we can do to support services. I think that's the other thing to say. So in 2016, I had no blessed idea how to do this. We've now got a maternity workforce toolkit. It, it's got all sorts of interesting information. I've just done a couple of screenshots for you to show you what's in here. You've got all sorts of interesting data, including indices of deprivation, 
uh, you've got birth rate plus linked in there. You've got all sorts of other bits and bobs. And then you've got some resources. So you've got a board paper, should you want to write a board paper, which you should have done. Um, you've got the, the workbook, the Excel workshop book, which is the key thing that you need to use for your staffing. You've got Five some information morning, about... Trixie, sorry. OK, oh, I better hurry up then. Sorry. I will zoom through this last bit. So starting point and absolutely fundamental is how many staff do I have in place to start with? I'm not going to go through all the maths of this, but you do need to know what is your recommended. So this column here says, what is my recommended numbers of midwives? This is what I'm funded to. This is what I've actually got. So I have to understand my current provision, position before I go any further and understand how the recommended links with what I'm going to do next. So I need to understand that birth rate plus said in this example, it's 206 midwives. I'm funded to 204, but I've only got 196. So actually, what do I need before I roll out my teams? So in this example, she's going to go for 206, but she reckons I can start rolling out my teams quite happily when I've got 200 in the bag. And so that's what she's going to do. She's also thought about this head of midwifery, and this is a real example from a real place. Um, she's worked out what her community provision is. So birth rate plus said 42 midwives for 4,807 women. That's a ratio of 1 to 114. And she also knows it's 70 midwives for 4,300 births. That's a ratio of 1 to 61. So she knows what's safe. She knows what safe looks like before she starts. And then we just go rolling down this hill here and you'll see we're nearly finished. I didn't, I wasn't originally intending to tell you all this, but I think it's really important that you know how this works. So now you, you've got the 200 midwives and you're going to put three teams in place. Where do I displace all these people from? I haven't got anybody else in. I've got 200, which is what I needed anyway to start with, regardless of whether I was doing continuity or not. So these 21 midwives are looking after 180, sorry, 882 women for community care and 756 for um, intrapartum care, leaving that many. But you'll see, so I could use some of my intrapartum midwives to go into my teams and I could also use some of my community midwives to go into my teams. And you can see that now this ratio is 1 to 57. Perfectly safe, far better than it was before. And if you go back to this example, the key bit here is in this example, I've got 13 people available for my intrapartum shift. In this example, I've got 14.5. So I'm actually doing far better. Thank you very much. Then I will get a few more in. So you're going to keep your eye on recruitment all the way through to get to the proper number of midwives. You're not going to suddenly stop. But you can see here now five teams displaced everybody, got a ratio of one to 50. So I know I'm safe and I've got 1.8 midwives extra for the extra support. I'm at 30 percent continuity and I've got 15 point. I've almost got 16 people available for my intrapartum care. And then finally, as we trot through, I'm not going to read every single one of them out. But I've now got 206, which was the recommended number that Birth Rate Plus said I needed in the first place. Um, and I've got 100% continuity and I've covered off everything. And I've ensured that my saver service is completely and utterly safe. So, just quickly, two more things to think about the shifted system. So, people can do continuity on a shifted system, but they will not get that relational change because they'll spend the majority of their time in the intrapartum area. That's what the math says. This is not Trixie's idea. This is just the maths. Whereas if you do it on a flexible model, it's around 30 hours a month. That gives you time for creative caring. And that is the thing that makes a difference. An example of good practice, James Paget, 85 percent continuity. Their data is showing. So this is one of their snapshot data pieces, but it's the same throughout. You can see that they've improved their clinical outputs. And this is just what one midwife said. Job satisfaction has massively improved. It makes sense to me for me to care for the whole family and, and so on and so forth. I won't read the whole quote in the interests of time. So we are asked as maternity services to do lots of things. And we don't know how to do them. We're a bit like this horse. We've got all these asks, all this jigsaw puzzle worth of asks. We don't know how to deliver it. But actually, if we use continuity of carer as our horse, if we give continuity of carer, we will reduce our smoking rates. We will increase our breastfeeding rates. We will stop women being uh, depressed. You know, when we talk about the low level depression, we will save babies' lives. And, and on and on and on it goes. It gives us the mechanism and the tool to deliver all our deliverables. And so Amanda, as SRO of 
of better births, you will just be able to have a great big tick because of having this first fundamental service delivery element uh, sorted out. So let's remind ourselves of why we're here. The hand that rocks the cradle rules the world, it really does. And I always say even Hitler had a mother and she was obviously not a happy woman, I don't expect. Pregnancy doesn't only just give us an opportunity to have a healthy a mother, healthy mother and baby at that tiny window of opportunity, i.e. the mother doesn't get sick and the baby is born crying and alive. What it does is it gives us the opportunity to save and change community health. So if the ICB nurse, uh, chief nurse is here, I don't know if she is, but she will know her responsibility is for the population health and she has to set the agenda. But by getting maternity services right and how we deliver that right, we will stop people dropping dead of heart disease age 60 unnecessarily and so on and so forth. And there is loads and loads of research out there all on the epigenetic elements of this. But also we're changing people's life chances. So the mother then isn't depressed because of the relational input we have given her. That means that, that child goes on to school and does better at school and as a consequence of that goes on and gets a job and we've 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 changed their opportunities too so hopefully i've given you a flavor of, of how this makes a difference and also hopefully answered some of the questions that were in the original um sheet i hope and if i didn't i'm very happy to answer them now i'm sorry if i went slightly over Thanks, Trixie. That's probably blown everybody's minds with uh, some of those numbers and things. Um, Trixie, I'm really conscious of time and I don't want to run into Steve's um, time either. So what I think we'll do, I think, Trixie, it gives rise to lots of questions. It certainly gives rise to lots of questions for me and how we balance the needs of the women and the needs of the workforce and how do we walk that line between all of that and I do wonder whether Abby I think we need to do a bit of a follow-up through the better births Trixie if you're happy to do that because Very I don't happy. feel we'll do it justice in a minute and I think I think there's a real open conversation to have and certainly it would be good to do that with our directors of midwifery I know I know um, Sarah here at Airedale's had to just dip out um, and I think Sarah was with us for a while but equally I'm not sure she is still but it would be good to do that Trixie I think. Um, very very because, happy. Yeah I, I think that would be really helpful in a in a uh, series of better births Abby through the steering group between me you Sarah and Sarah because for me it's raised lots of questions it'd be good to have the opportunity to uh, have that discussion with you. And um, Abby, so Trixie, thank you so much for that. That was uh, fantastic, really helpful, fantastic insight into uh, continuity of carer. I think we're going to have a quick break, Abby, and then we're going to come back for Steve's talk. So yeah, that would be minutes. great. If we've got time for a quick comfort break for everyone and then we will reconvene. Shall we say three minutes past? Yeah, that sounds good. I'll be there. Great, thank you. <clears throat> I'm going to reshare the mentee, so please do join if you are able to and answer some of the questions. Thank you. Abby, can I just check something? Are you going to in, are you, did you see it just me? Are you going to bring me on when it starts? Are you going to yeah, bring I think me Amanda on? will, yeah, or myself. Or Amanda. Yeah. <clears throat> right. Because <clears throat> I'm just thinking when I'm on, I don't have any slides. So if you could pin me so I'm full screen, is that all right? Because I'm just going to be. Of course. Yeah, does it makes sense to have that. me on full if I'm going to be doing my thing. Because I'm really, I'm going to use this. Right. So what's, if you see me, if I'm only, if if I'm only tiny in the screen. corner of the screen, they won't be able to see me. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. It's no slides, but I'm easy. I'm dead easy. Right. I'll be. I'm. I'm here. I'm not going to go anywhere now. I'll hang around.
Abby, shall we get started again? OK, everyone, hopefully everybody's back, uh, ready for the last uh, session. I am going to introduce Steve Head, who uh, is our inspirational speaker. Huge amount of experience working not only with NHS teams, I don't think, Steve, but a wide variety of teams across a wide variety of interests and industries. Um, so thank you for coming, Steve. We hugely appreciate um, your time. I'm going to hand over to you to let you do more of an introduction in terms of, of the work that you do, if that's OK. That's perfectly fine. Thanks, Amanda. Cheers. Right. We've got 55 minutes, I believe. Right. So I'm going to cram quite a lot into this. So I will tell you a little bit more about myself. I'll just spend a few seconds on that. So my background is uh, I have spent 20 years, just over nearly 21 years, running a business which gets me in front of audiences all over the world, mostly through the UK, 65% of which are NHS, <clears throat> from all different backgrounds and all different specialities. Um, my, my work is all word of mouth, so I don't ring anyone and say, can I pretty book me? It's normally somebody seeing me. In this case, I think it was Jill is responsible. So if this goes really well, then, uh, then it's me. And if it goes really badly, then it's Jill, right? So it's Jill's to blame. So she brought me in. So we worked together in the past on, on different occasions. And um, my, the rest of my life, 30% is corporate. So I could be with Santander or I could be with Microsoft uh, or even just a local company who are trying to you know, sell a few widgets. And my job generally, I, I qualified. I was doing an event, actually, just to put things into context. I was doing an event a couple of weeks ago with a company called Vorbos, who are a brand new growing business in London who put down cable. So they put down fiber optics. They communicate, connect the world. And uh, I, I was doing a team leadership event, of one of five for them. And as I stood in the room, I noticed everybody was about 23. And as I looked at these people, I've got a 22-year-old daughter and a 25-year-old son. These, I thought these could all be my children. And, uh, and then I'm, I said to them, I was teaching them a session on coaching and how to get the best out of people. 
And I said to them, and this was true, I said, I started my coaching. I got my very first coaching qualification at the age of 18. And as I stand before you today, I'm 58 years old. So 40 years ago, I qualified, first of all, my first co coaching qualification. And I looked at the room and I thought, you weren't even a twinkle in your mother's eye when I, you weren't, you weren't even, even thought about. And here I am talking about something I've done for 40 years. So my job has always been about helping people. It's always been about giving people strategies and tools. And over the last 20 years, I've run leadership programs and events. And I've learned as much, like this morning, I've listened in all the way through. And I learned such a lot listening to the various research, the studies, the work, the challenges, and what is going on in people's world, and it helps me. Today, I'm going to spend the next 50 minutes or so sharing some tips, practical tools. Whenever I sit in an event and I'm listening, giving up my valuable time for something, as you are this morning, I always think if you can get to 12 o'clock today and have a technique, a method, something you can use in your work or personal life that can build that resilience that was mentioned earlier on today. I spend my whole life talking about resilience. I think it's a word that's probably used too much because people don't know quite what they mean by it, but fundamentally, I agree with the definitions from before, it's building up techniques and strategies to deal with stress and un unforeseen events and being able to bounce back. And uh, clearly, if you don't, as, as was mentioned again earlier, I thought it was a great metaphor. I had a client recently ring me um, for a one to one and she dealt with NHS complaints. That was her job. And she'd gone through all sorts of challenges. Her husband had made me redundant and she'd moved house and her, her sister was in care and there was all sorts of stuff going on. And I said to her, uh, have you ever been on an aeroplane? This analogy was mentioned earlier. Um, and I said, you know, have you ever been on an aeroplane? Yeah. Have you ever heard them say, put your belt on, take your belt off? And they never ever say, help as many people as you can before you put your mask on. They will say, put your mask on first. And that was mentioned earlier. And I think that's a really good uh, strategy, but something we all hear, but don't do so well. And I, and I like the idea that you've done a session this morning talking about who cares for the carer and how does that all work? Because it's very easy to be out there doing your job every day and thinking, well, you're just going to be all right. Everybody else is the one that needs it. So this is a moment of mask on first. That's what this session is. Um, my background is pharmaceuticals as well. I used to sell drugs back in the day. Um, and then my 20 odd years in coaching and sport and performance in the last few years. Uh, I Just to give you a bit of heads up, I've got a 22 year old daughter. Uh, I've got a 25 year old son and I've got my wife and I've been married 29 years. And I'm going to finish this session this morning, actually, with a very interesting, I think, very relevant story to midwifery as well, which I want you to hear because I think it's incredibly important uh, from a perspective. And I've been asked to speak at a number of midwifery events over the years. And the particular story I'm going to share at the end seems to go down particularly well. So uh, I've tailored it just for you. Um, so, yes, yeah, so a bit of background, also mental health. I want to talk a bit about what mental well-being. My mother was uh, depressed all of her life, pretty much for 40 odd years. Uh, sadly, we lost my mum a few years ago. Um, and I want to just I'll mention a little bit about mental well-being. I'm not talking about mental well-being because it's in the news and because it's topical, because it was in my family for 40 years. And I think when you've had a relative who's been sectioned and been cared for for paranoia and dementia and so on, uh, you certainly pay attention to mental well-being more than perhaps others might. Um, and that's clearly been a thread for today in some of the research that was shared earlier on. So with that in mind. Here we go. So just to take you back, uh, just he just headline, very quick anecdote. You remember beginning of 2020, uh, we had uh, the very the five o'clock regular meetings on TV with uh, Chris Whitty, Patrick Vallance and Boris updating us. Uh, on the 16th of March, at that point, my business hadn't been affected. My job is basically driving 40,000 miles a year, driving to events, walking in a room, presenting to shed a load of people and then leaving. Uh, and on the 16th of March, Boris said to me, and I think he said it to me, he said, Steve, as of tomorrow, you can't go in a room with other people. And I thought, ah, that's a bit of a problem. And then um, I looked at my son. My son is a close up professional magician. He's uh, which is, by the way, I did say that right. When he was 17, he was not happy at school. And he says, I don't know what I want to do with my life. And I said, if you could do anything, son, what would you do? And he said, I'd be a magician. And I said, oh, physician, that's a good idea. Turns out he hadn't said physician. He'd said magician. Anyway, he left school, became a full time professional magician, got into the magic circle, which is quite hard to do. And he performs at weddings. Well, of course, from Boris's statement on the 16th of March 2020, weddings were cancelled. Events were cancelled. And that, the, probably the most difficult bit was my daughter, Anna, who was 22 and completing, well, 20 at the time, completing three years of intensive dance training at vocational dance school. And four days later, everyone was sent home. No performance in front of the agents, no crescendo moment, no jobs, no cruise ships, just stopped. And a, a really interesting quote came out, I think it was on Twitter, and I think you'll relate to this. And the quote was, regarding COVID, we're all in the same storm, but we're all in different boats. 
So if I had you in front of me now in a room and I was looking at you saying, I know what you had to deal with, you'd go, Steve, you have no idea what I had to deal with because everybody's experience was different depending on your family, your situation, your workload, your experiences, and not least the jobs that you do. So um, I started doing free coaching for the NHS. I decided, because I came in my office, this is my actual office, it's not a false background, I just sat down there, I hadn't got a clue what was going on, I don't think any of us really understood the scale of what was about to happen. And I thought, I've never not worked all my life, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to start for free coaching. So I'd ring up clients, send videos to chief nurses and say, look, do you need any help? And I'd start doing webinars. And, uh, and I just want to read a little list to you. I'm only going to spend a minute on this, but it just gives you some topics that I ended up helping people with from all different areas, from clinical, uh, frontline service, maternity obviously services, as well as non-clinical teams. And these were the most common topics that I found I was helping people, individuals with trying to cope with all of the challenges of their jobs and then COVID on top. And I'll just headline them. The first and most common one was work-life balance. And I'm really interested that's been mentioned today um losing drive and motivation the never endingness of it the feeling that it's groundhog day losing connection with the team and bearing in mind one of the key things that's come out from this morning which i fully endorse is one of the key key um, ingredients for highly effective teams and, and and adding to your resilience is social support and that seemed to diminish such a lot and people were feeling feeling broken. Our chief nurse said to me one day, Steve, we're together, we're on the front line, but we're so smothered in PPE, we can't even hug each other anymore. And, I, and it was that kind of uh, feedback that I found quite interesting. Exhaustion, mental health issues, there's a whole plethora of those. Dealing with uncertainty and, of course, family challenges. People forget, like the, the care, the care, care for the carer, you do your day job after whatever length of shift you've done and then you go home and it all starts again. It all kicks off. Life doesn't stop. Dealing with family, dealing with furlough, which was obviously back in the day, dealing with colleagues and also the fear of infection. And then, of course, as COVID's eased back and it's now back to new normal, whatever that might mean, we're now starting to deal with all those challenges that you've been dealing with all the way through this and, of course, pre-COVID. So I decided to put some material together to help people put the masks on first and give them some tools to deal with these challenges. And that's what I'm going to share with you. So to get you started, um, I will show you, well, I'm going to share something with you. This is really important. I think it fits beautifully. I was 50-50 about bringing this in because I haven't got a lot of time, but I want to mention this because I think some of you will find this helpful. In 2010, my mother was sectioned under the Mental Health Act. I've talked about that briefly. I won't go into the details. Suffice to say, she was very poorly. I live in Newbury in Berkshire. I'm from Newcastle. I'm from Gateshead, actually. My wife's from Newcastle. I can't just pop into Newcastle, right? I'm 300 miles away. Um, and I was driving around the country in 2010 doing my job, turning up at events and presenting. My mother had been sectioned. She had early stage dementia, paranoia and serious major depressive disorder. Uh, she was under the care of a psychiatrist. And I was driving to an event and I was very tired and I realised I was trying to do events, get to Manchester maybe on a Friday, drive to Newcastle, see my mother for two days, drive back. And my job is effectively cheering people up against their will. I walk in rooms and I say stuff to try and make people feel better and give them tools to perform. And I didn't really feel like cheering anybody up, if I'm honest. And I was pretty tired and uh, I was driving to an event one day and Jeremy Vine came on the radio and he said, after the break, we have a psychiatrist on the show who's going to be talking about his brand new book, The Curse of the Strong, which I think, by the way, is an excellent title for a book. So I thought, Curse of the Strong, I'm in. I turned the volume up and I started listening. The psychiatrist then introduced the concept of stress-induced depression, which I was familiar with, but made me think. When, you, when you're all fine, you're coping seemingly all right with the world, but eventually just take on just a little bit too much and you suddenly can't cope so well. And he just described the situation. Then people ring in the Jeremy Vine show with stories and a gentleman who I don't know, I don't ring radio shows, but this guy did, rang in the show and he said, Jeremy, I'm in my 40s and I think I may have had the curse of the strong. And he wanted to describe his life. And he says, I run my own business, which I do. So I related to the fella and I was in my 40s at the time. He said, I drive thousands of miles a year, which I did at the time. He says, I meet my clients. I try to be the best businessman, the best dad, the best brother, the best son. I've never had a day sick in my life. I thought, that's me. That's how I was brought up. I was brought up that if you came downstairs on a morning when you were at school and you said, I don't feel very well, your dad would go, you can walk, you're going to school, right? That was how I was brought up. You don't take time off, you just get on with it. And so I related to everything this guy said. And then he said three years ago, now this was 2012 when this was on. So three years ago, that was about 2009, just after the recession, he said, I, uh, I just hit a wall. I was driving to, an, to a client and something just switched like a fuse in my brain. And he says, and I just pulled over the hard shoulder and I switched my engine off and I couldn't drive. And it was really quite scary because I knew at that time I was pushing, I was burning the candle at both ends, as they say. 
But you just get on with it, don't you? You don't mourn, you just crack on. And I remember just as I was listening to the radio show and this guy told his story, which is unbelievably close to my heart, my, that my radio then cut out. My wife rang me. She said, are you listening to Jeremy Vine? And I said, well, I was. I'm listening to you now. She said, well, that could be you. You're doing too much. You need to slow down. Now, my wife's a Zumba teacher and her favourite phrase seems to be, it'll be fine. Whereas my experience is, unless I do it, it probably won't. So anyway, I was getting stick for doing too much. And then about six months later, at the end of 2012, on the 16th of November, the reason I remember the date is because it's my birthday. You might want to write that down. So 16th of November, I was 49 years old and I was driving up to Manchester to do a teacher's conference. I spent all day cheering teachers up against their will. I drove back home. And I got to the front door. Now, you will relate to this. I promise you. I've j I was in a room the other day with a group of therapists, people who do therapy, CBT and counselling. Again, who cares for those carers? Because they're very good at helping everybody else, but not so good at doing it for themselves. And I had them all in front of me. And I was telling the story and I said, you know those days where you come home from work and you get to your front door and you don't want to talk to anybody? Right. You're not a nasty person. You just need 10 minutes, just 10 minutes. And you can't even get your coat off when you've got little children. They greet you at the door like, oh, you're here now. And you go, just let me get my coat off. And if they've got pictures when they're little, they want to show you something. And you're so stressed. You're so, I haven't had time to switch off. And you look at your child and you go, first of all, you can't draw. Secondly, I never know what it is. And thirdly, you're not even my favourite child. You don't say that, obviously, but you feel so overwhelmed. And I came in this night from my day's work up in Manchester. And I was exactly like that. I knew when I got home, I thought, I'm just, I'm just like, I just feel like I'm buzzing, but not in a good way. And I, I, my wife looked at me and she knows me more than anyone. And she said, you need to sit down. And I sat in the living room and shut the door. And I said to Abby, I said, I could barely do it today. I've never felt like this before. Normally I'm buzzing and I'm feeling great. And I just didn't. I did it, but it was hard work. I don't know if I can keep doing this. And I sat down and Abby says, well, I've got you a present. And she looked at me and she handed me this. I'm going to tell you, this is the original thing she gave me. This is 10 years ago. And she says, it's, it's a little book. I think you'll enjoy it. And I opened the wrapping to be greeted by that. That's the book my wife bought me, Depressive Illness, The Curse of the Strong. She says, that's the book off the radio from six months ago. I said, great. How long have you had it? I've had it in the bedside drawer for six months. I said, you've had the answer to me problems in a drawer. And he kept them a secret. Nice. Anyway, she gave me it out of love. I didn't read it on my birthday. It's not a birthday read. And I don't think we're all going to be depressed. I think we get low. I think we get stressed. I think we get angst. I think we get overwhelmed sometimes. Most people cope ultimately with the challenges that are thrown at us. But what a fantastic read. And I read this on the Monday after my birthday. And to say that it was relevant would be an understatement. I've mentioned this to pretty much every audience the last 10 years, regardless of COVID, because stress has been there forever. COVID just added layers to it, didn't it? And I've had the author, Dr. Cantifer, write to me to thank me from his yacht, probably. Anyway, I'm going to read you nine bullet points. By the way, I'm going to send follow up notes on my session as well, which I want you to post out and share. Right. So please don't worry about writing notes. If you want to write stuff down, do I will send references. I will send follow ups. I will send a couple of visuals and you'll just you'll just have a little prompt to remind you of some of this stuff. I got to page six. I was on a train when I read this. I'll never forget. He says patients present with the following personality characteristics. These are people who have hit their wall, suddenly gone. I can't do this anymore. You're a person of moral strength. You are reliable. You are diligent. You have a strong conscience, a strong sense of responsibility. You focus on the needs of others before your own. You are sensitive, you are vulnerable to criticism and your self-esteem is dependent on the evaluation of others. Every single time I read those nine bullet points, which is pretty much every single day of my life, I relate to them so much myself. It's how I was brought up. I didn't tell you this, but when I was a young lad, I was the youngest of three boys. I was born in 63. My middle brother, Eric, was born in 62. And my eldest brother, John, was born in 54. John had severe cerebral palsy and ataxia nervosa and various other complexities around that. When you're brought up in a family where your early memories when I'm five, six, seven as a teenage brother who needs dressing and washing and cleaning and changing and taking care of, you know, it, it, it makes you a certain way. I mean, I would never ever want my child to be any different, but it does make you a certain person. And, um, and as I've got older, the thought of letting somebody down, the thought of not turning up on time, the thought of not doing your job well, the thought of, you know, not getting positive feedback, is just ingrained in me being. And I don't know any of you watching this or any of the colleagues that you work with, but I've worked with enough healthcare professionals and enough midwives and maternity experts over the years and specialists to know that you care. You really care. It's very rare. I'm not saying you don't get tired and sometimes you can't quite care the way you'd like, 
But I know that even when you have a bad day, you come away going, oh, why couldn't I have done a bit more today? And you always do the best you can. So I think that's never an issue for me. It's all about getting, as you've talked about in the last session, getting the system around you, right, to enable you to do it the way you need to do it. But I'm not really talking about the system, I'm talking just about this. So as I read those nine bullet points, I have a daughter that was at dance school, Anna is her name. Uh, she came sadly home after four days when COVID was announced. Uh, it was a real anticlimax. Uh, she's got another quality, my daughter, which I have to take some responsibility for because she's my daughter, is she's also a perfectionist. I won't ask you to put your hand up or pass a comment, but I guarantee there's some perfectionists watching me today. And the benefit of being a perfectionist is you'll achieve a lot because you'll always push and push and push for just that little bit more. The downside is whatever you achieve, however good, it will never be enough. It never make you happy because you'll always find fault. My daughter was doing a dance in second year. And it was the end of year dance for the, for, I say dance, it was world-class West End performance stuff they were doing. And all the dancers came out from dance school, ready to go home for the summer break. And mothers and parents and families and friends were here to watch the finale show. And I remember a woman came over and said to our daughter, Anna, who was 20 or 19 or something at the time, or 18, and said, Anna, that was amazing. I can't take my eyes off you. You're an amazing performer. You've got such stage presence and just showered her with praise. And it was great because as a parent, she never listens to us. But I thought this is another woman's parent saying something. This is great. Another girl's parent. And Anna's response as this lady walked away was, I bet she says that to everybody. That's how she handled praise. However, and this is interesting. Anybody says anything critical to her? Apparently it's true. Apparently it's true. If it's compliments, you made it up. But if it's uh, if it's praise, we don't hold on to that, which brings me to my first visual. That's right. I have visuals, but not slides. I thought we'll do this a bit different. Now, I think the chat box is working because I've got mine up and I did type in before. Uh, hi, everyone, just to make sure mine was working as well. So I think can you see hi everyone in there? Does it does it come up in the chat? Brilliant. Right. So what I want you to do, do me a favor, do me a interaction for this little bit. If you've seen me before, you know I've been around a lot last 20 years, so you might have seen me before. I've seen Steve do stuff before, so just don't do anything now. Just relax for a second. But if you haven't seen me before, I want you to join into this bit. I'm going to reveal a visual which I prepared earlier. It is really, really clear, and I will actually bring the flip chart up to the camera so you can really see it clearly. Uh, all I want you to do, and I will wait because normally a little pause uh, between me showing you when you've been able to type it in. I'd like you to type a very quick bullet of feedback on what you're about to see. Will you do that for me? Just put your hands up if I can see you, so you're able to hear. You know what I want? I want a little comment of feedback. Can I say, brilliant, thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Andrew's involved, he's engaged, here we go. Right, so here's the visual, and as soon as you see it, get your fingers on your keypads, type a comment. I'm just gonna read, I'll give you, I'll take a breath while you do it. Right, that's it there. Just bring it up to the camera for you, so you can see it. Can you see that? There you go, it's got light shining on it. So you got to do is look at it and then type a comment. By the way, this is quite heavy, so take your time. Right, there you go. And what I'm going to do while you're doing your little comment, I'm going to have a sip of water. And I'm just going to read, I'm just going to read what you type in. It should, it should scroll normally. That's it, brilliant. Thank you very much. Look, hi. I've got a high back there. Thank you for that. Excellent. There we go. I'm just scrolling up. Sinead's put a little comment on there. Thank you. You're doing great. I love you. Brilliant. Good. Kirsten's put a few comments. Thank you. I love the comment there. Who's that? Abby. Three out of four ain't bad. That's a nice way of putting it. Four fours are 16, not 15. Right. I tell you, see, you, that's good. Sorry, at least that's lovely. You get the gist. Incorrect last one. So when you do this live in a room, that is to say with people who can shout out rather than type, 99% uh, of the time, well, not all the time, in fact, but 99% of an audience shout out something like last one's wrong. I did one the other day and somebody shouted out, it was Health Education England I was working with, and they said, somebody just shouted out 16. I thought it was nice of them. But this will make you smile. So when my daughter was home and really sad after the dance school had all shut down and everything went to pot, I said to her, she was in her bedroom feeling very melancholy and very low. I said, Anna, would you like me to run a little event? on Zoom for you and your fellow dancers who've all, all gone through a bit of a difficult time. She says, Daddy, that would be amazing. I said, right, I will then. So I got them all on Zoom, all the little faces looking at me, and I'd met most of them throughout the years we've been going up to the school to see them dance and perform. So I knew a few of them, I had a bit of connection, and I says, right, guys, let me show you something. Just type a comment in chat, if you would. So these are all 18, 19, 20-year-old, fit, athletic, amazing people, OK, going through the COVID thing with the uncertainty of what that was about. But nevertheless, the whole life is ahead of them. And I said, right, type a comment. And I put this up in front of them. And the response I got back was wrong, 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 wrong. Last one's wrong. Last one's wrong. Yuck, I hate maths. 
that's what I got back from. I thought, now, that's an interesting response because, as you've just rightly pointed out, isn't it interesting, and two or three of you did this brilliantly well, of course, is uh, we tend to focus on the 15, right? That's the bit that's wrong, the bit that's missing, the bit that's not good, the bit that needs to be fixed, which is absolutely fair. I understand that. But what about all the good stuff you do? What about the positives? How much time does that get looked at? One of my favourite quotes at the moment is a quote that goes like this. Success leaves clues. When things go well, there's reasons why it's gone well. Just as when things go badly, there's reasons why things go badly. So it's interesting to me that, and, and, and this slide is not about ignoring bad things. Clearly, do not take the message away that, you know, everything's fine. If, if you walk into a room and there's somebody lying on the floor, you don't go, at least the rest of them are in beds. You know, you pick them up, don't you? You sort them out. And if the kitchen's on fire, you put the fire out. I'm never going to say ignore bad things. That will be willful blindness, and that's a dangerous strategy. What I am going to say is, if we're going to perform from a mental health perspective, if nothing else, think about yourself. How many people in here, and we'll do a show of hands for this. You can do a little emoji hand or you can just do a real hand if I can see you. How many of you watching me now talk to yourselves? By a show of hands. Thank you. Claire's a yes. Andrew's got his hand up there. Thank you for that. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Right. And the answer is most of us do. Whenever I ask that question live, I get people go, yes, I talk to myself. And there's always two or three in the room going, do I talk to myself? And of course, the answer is you're doing it all the time. We're always chatting to ourselves. The question is, what's the quality of your self-talk? And if there's one thing you and I know, we've got control of two things in the world. We've got control of this, and we've got control of this. When you get past 50, you start to lose a bit of control of this, but that's another story. But the point is, we've got control to a degree, haven't we? We can influence our families. We can influence our uh, the women that you serve. You can influence their families. You can, But you don't control them. You just influence. But this thing, we've got a degree of control over. And I'm always a great believer that and in sports and performance, and again, the other day I was chatting to some CBT specialists which was fascinating because there's quite a big overlap in our work. I'm a coach, not a clinical person, but it's getting people's attention to the 149. From a mental health perspective and from a resilience perspective, it's unbelievably powerful. And during this session, within the next 30 minutes, I'm going to share with you five very specific tips that take no more than two minutes a day to do, that if you do them consistently just for just a few weeks, um, there's evidence I'm going to I'm going to share a piece of data with you on it. I'm just going to just share these things that can significantly impact on how you feel, your sense of positivity, your sense of well-being and add to your resilience toolkit. Right. I'm going to show you that before we finish. I'd be doing you an injustice if I didn't. And then they're, they're just such simple tips that only take a short amount of time. And I promise you are worthwhile. I promise you they are. Let me get tell you one more thing about this and another little thing I want you to be aware of. So. A few years ago, my mother-in-law, who is 75 and still working, she's doing very well, Sheila, she works up in the Metro Centre selling perfumes. Um, she asked me for a book for Christmas or for her birthday. And the book was called How to Be Human by Ruby Wax. So I bought her the book and I thought I'll read it before I give it to her because it's better value. So I, I read it. And then I've got the audible copy as well, because I quite like listening to Ruby's voice. And for those who don't know Ruby Wax, American comedian, author, actress, but more recently and more importantly for this story, trained as a psychologist at Oxford. And she she wrote this book, How to Be Human, with a, with a Buddhist monk and a neuroscientist. So the Buddhist does the mindfulness stuff. And by the way, the audible book, because mindfulness is really big at the minute. Yoga, you know, anything gets you in a restful state, a calm state. Uh, and Bendy, if it's yoga. Um, the, the final chapter, if you get the audible version, is the Buddhist monk taking you through mindfulness exercises. And I promise you, if you're sitting still somewhere quietly, it's worth having it just for that last chapter. Because I'm not a mindfulness, I'm, I'm on it, I'm full on all the time. But I remember sitting in my car one day thinking, oh, you need to calm yourself down, son. And I just sat in the car in a car park in the middle of a field near a driving range where I've been hitting some balls. And I put this book on and the last chapter came on and I sat and listened and I was asleep in about 15 minutes. It is great. So if you want a bit of mindfulness stuff without paying a fortune for it, buy Ruby Wax's book for that. But the reason I mention it is not for that. She has had depression, Ruby. She talks about it openly in her book uh, all of her life. She was abused as a child. She goes through all of that. And she does it in a fairly interesting way, given that she's a comedian. She has a bit of a light and dark shades to it. But she turns to the neuroscientist. Who, who in theory knows how your brain works and which bits do what. And she said, I can be living my life pretty fine. And then all of a sudden an event could be quite innocuous. I might lose my laptop, which on the scale of things isn't the end of the world. Or I might remember a memory from 40 years ago that my mother did something to me. And she says, and suddenly I'll, the clouds will descend and the depression kicks in. 
sometimes for weeks on end, and I'm useless to the world. Why does this happen, she says. And the neuroscientist, and I shall paraphrase the answer, he says, when it comes to good things, Ruby, your brain is like Teflon. Good things tend to slide away because there's no evolutionary benefit in accessing good things quickly. They're there. They just don't need to be quickly accessed. When it comes to bad things, particularly things that have threatened you or put you in a state of fear, your brain is like Velcro. Bad things tend to stick and the good things tend to slide away. The little story I just told you about my daughter. It's interesting. She used to do ballet on every Monday morning. She did it every day. And she would say to us on a Sunday night on FaceTime, oh, it's ballet an hour and a half. I'm so hard, so hard. But I said, you've done it since you were four. You're good at ballet, sweetheart. You know you'll get through it. You always do. And she'd do a ballet class. And so she would get on with the week with an hour and a half of ballet and tap and jazz and contemporary and Pilates and literally 10 hours a day of training. And then she'd do that the next day and the next day and the next day. But in the ballet class, the head of ballet, who was a bit of a prima donna, would be doing the ballet class and all the girls doing their arabesques. And it's a, it's a precision sport. So if you have your arms like this, they should be like this. They pull you over and they move your arms and they position your body. And he would say, yeah, your bum sticks out too far. If your bum sticks out like that, you'll never make it in the dance world. And then he would go on with the rest of his class. And then she would do da Pilates and jazz and tap and more ballet and jazz and tap and Pilates. And then she'd get to Friday night and the FaceTime update with mummy and daddy. How's it going, sweetheart? How's your week been? She's done all sorts of wonderful things. Triple pirouettes that she's landed perfectly. Jazz classes and got awards and recognitions and accolades for. She's won a choreography award. She had a fantastic week. And as I get her on FaceTime at seven o'clock on a Friday night, after 50, sometimes even 60 hours of interactions and training, a little tears start pouring down her face. And I go, sweetheart, what is it? And me and Abby looking at her, oh my God, what's going on? What's happened this week? It must have been awful. It's nothing, it's nothing. Come on, what is it? It's just something that the head of ballet said on Monday morning. Interesting. 50 hours of stuff, good, bad and indifferent. But the one thing you've decided to pay attention to is your bum's too big. It wouldn't surprise you to know that by the time she got to second year, we got a lovely phone call one night, middle of the week. She says, uh, Mommy, Daddy, you're not going to like what I'm about to tell you. Which, by the way, for any child and a parent is an interesting attention grabber. And we both went, what is it? My relationship with food isn't very good. And as soon as she said that sentence, she says, what do you mean? I knew exactly what she meant. She's in the dance world, a toxic world. And now she doesn't really like to eat much. That's, by the way, a bloody big 15. And you don't go, well, at least the rest of your life's fine. You get in your car, you drive to Chester, you sit with your child and you say, we need to sort this out. Right? We need to train your brain to find more of this. Because there's irrational thoughts going on if you're not looking at yourself in the way you should be. And I'm not a therapist. And of course, we involved some experts in that process. I'm not saying what I'm about to tell you fixed my daughter, but it certainly helped. Um, I spend my life coaching people. That's all I do. I help people to perform at their best. That is my job. I'm going to send you flip charts for all the bits. And, um, and so I'm just going to share with you now uh, a couple of strategies that you might want to apply to train your brain to be more constructive, especially when you're under pressure, right? So let me just show you this. Let's get a nice little fresh set of paper here. And here we go, right. So can I just check? We've got 10 minutes on this, and then I've got a couple of bullets to share, and then a couple of summary points to share with you. So have you come across the book, The Chimp Paradox? Can I just check those with a show of hands? Have you come across it? Jill, you've seen it? If you shake the hands, one or two hands going up. Thank you for your little handies there. Um, don't worry if you haven't seen it or have seen it. It's a good read. It's a thick book. And it's written by a guy called Professor Steve Peters, a psychiatrist from Middlesbrough, who's done 40 years in psychiatry and became famous by coaching the Team GB cyclists. That's all you need to know. And Ronnie O'Sullivan. Ronnie O'Sullivan recently won the Snooker World Championships for the seventh time, I think. And he was asked a question at the end of his uh, success. Uh, he was asked... Uh, how do you feel about your victory? It's amazing. You've come back and you're world champion again. And his first response to that question was, I'd like to thank Professor Steve Peters for all of his help. The chimp paradox author. He's the guy that's helped him keep his brain calm. Uh, Peters took 40 years to develop his materials. I'm going to share the concept in about six and a half minutes. This is Steve Peters' chimp paradox, Geordie style. He talks about the chimp. He talks about the human and he talks about the computer, which he refers to as an autopilot. Now, let me explain how these systems work. Life throws stimulus at you. You've heard a load of that this morning. I've learned a lot about your world this morning. The amount of things that you have to deal with, the complexity of what you deal with, not just the logistics of staffing, but all the other elements that go on 
with the in insights you have to have to be able to, to treat every or to deliver care or deliver the service in a way that is so personalized to all of the women that you see. And it's, it's clearly not that simple. Stimulus comes in the form of people, workload, demands, expectations, COVID. And ironically, it's, a, it's a received by the chimp. The chimp is described as the most irrational, catastrophic, emotional part of the brain, the fight or flight. Have you ever let your chimp send an email? Have you ever gone, I'll give you a piece of my mind, send. Ha! Have you ever had somebody cut you up in traffic and you've given them a body language signal to, to let them know how unhappy you are? Have you done that? Just gone, don't you cut me up again. One of those. That's your chimp. The chimp receives a signal, sends a message into here, and it asks the question, what's your wiring? This is all your wiring. This is what makes you who you are. The human is the rational part of the brain. When you're calm and relaxed, as hopefully you are now, you can listen to this with clear mind and clear eyes. You can go, you know what? This is interesting. Whereas if you're stressed and overwhelmed, that's when you get very agitated and the chimp overwhelms you. So you've got these forces in your brain. Um, let me tell you a quick story to illustrate what I mean, just so you 100% understand this. I'm also going to give you a little technique uh, before I share my five tips with you. Um, so my wife and I have been married 29 years. We met in January of 93, married in June of 93. So we've known each other five months. Uh, and there's only one downside about marrying somebody after five months. You can't possibly know each other because I've only just met the woman. Then we moved in together and I found there was a difference. I was born with a family. I've mentioned my brother, John, who was in a wheelchair. I've got my mum who was depressed and very low a lot of the time, understandably with the stresses John brought into the family and all the stresses he had in his life. And so it was like water and eggshells. And I learned a very important strategy when I was a kid. And it stuck with me and it's wired and it, it isn't going anywhere is that if I want my mum to be happy, keep the house tidy. Hoover, dust, tidy up, put stuff away. Make your beds, polish the surfaces, tidy the kitchen, clean the benches down, uh, put everything away, puff the cushions up. And if you do that, your mother will be happier and more tolerable to live with. I learned that from when I was five, six, seven, eight years old. You're looking at the tidiest bloke in the world. If I had a tattoo, it would say, Hoover, dust, and tidy up. That's me. I'm gonna use this red pen to illustrate how many neurons, this is where all your wiring is, are allocated to tidying up in my brain, right? So I'm just gonna draw it just in proportion to everything else that I'm wired to do. This is uh, how many neurons are allocated to tidying up. Right, can you see that? Can I just check, you see that? Good, so can I. So, um, so stimulus is mess. Chimp, when it sees it goes, ah! Right, because it doesn't like it very much. I'm just letting you know. I married my wife after five months of knowing her. Her family, her mum and dad met on a cruise ship. Her dad's a guitarist. He's 80 years old now. And her mum was a hairdresser. They met in the Caribbean. They're very chilled out people. Abby's a very chilled out woman. I believe, whereas I was brought up on Hoover, dust, tidy up or else, her family motto was leave it out because you might need it again. Because not once in 29 years has my wife ever muttered the, 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 the sentence, that needs putting away. And then on the 23rd of March, 2020, Boris Johnson said, be under the same roof together for 24 hours a day. I think you'll find that fine. I found that quite hard. I'm gonna use this black pen to illustrate how many neurons, for comparison reasons, are my wife's brain allocated to tidying up based on her upbringing. Right, can you see the conflict here? Right, because you probably can't see that and neither can I. Now, this is how the chimp works. So you might be saying, Steve, you've been a bit critical of your wife. You've just talked about 149 positivity, finding the good, thinking about all the positives. Yes, I know. When my wife's a good cook, we love to cook together. She cooks fantastic food. Never had an issue in 29 years with the end product. Methodology leaves a bit to be desired. That is to say, she uses every pan, every spatula, everything we've ever had, and seems to need it for every meal. We've got a little bin on the bench, she put uh, food waste in. She doesn't lift the lid, she just puts it round like a display and it just bakes itself to the bench. Right. My chimp can't not do that. I have to have everything put exactly where it needs to be. I cooked the chicken sweet and sour the other day with chicken and chilli and garlic and ginger. When I'd finished, there were four plates of chicken sweet and sour. Right. A Dettol bench, a clean cooker and a dishwasher ready to go. My wife made an omelette the other day. I couldn't get in the kitchen. I thought, how did she do this? And this is where conflict can arise unless you put a little system in to stop it. Now, this is a true story from two years ago, three years ago, before Covid. I was presenting in Manchester. And the day before I was in the office, which is here, and I was in the house chatting to Abby and I was tidying up and I kept the kitchen immaculate. And I walked in the kitchen about seven o'clock at night and I had this letter that I prepared during my office day, which was needed to be mailed to HMRC first class. I placed it on the bench and I said to Abby, would you mail that letter tomorrow? Because I'm up at four and I won't be back till seven tomorrow night. 
would you mail that first class? And she said, yes, I will. And you know, when you think somebody hasn't listened to you and you go, when I say mail it, if you don't mail it, I could go to prison. And I made a little joke and she laughed and we laughed. And I said, seriously, she says, honey, I've got the morning, I've got Zumba, and then I'm going to go to the central post office. And I'm going to mail your letter first class. I said, that's great. I went off to do my job the next day. Two hours from home, I get a phone call from my wife. She goes, where are you? And I said, I'm two hours away. She says, well, you'd be pleased to know I've cooked a lovely meal for when you come in. Because you've had a busy week. And I went, brilliant. So then I put the phone down. What she doesn't understand, though, now I've got two hours for me and my chimp to think, what's my kitchen going to look like when I get to my front door? So we had to put it to our marriage. By the way, this is before COVID, about 15 years ago, I introduced a little system into our marriage. And to say it saved us, I think would be an understatement, right? The system is this. I'll write it down. You'll not forget it anyway. It's not that complicated. It's called the four minutes rule. I've taught this to so many healthcare professionals over the last 20 years and have had so much feedback on this. The four minute rule simply says that when you walk into a room, a transition, even from one team's meeting to another, but certainly from one position to another, one room to another. In this example, going home through the front door, you can't say anything negative or critical about anything to anyone for four minutes. I'll say that again. You can't say anything negative or critical about anything to anyone for four minutes unless the kitchen's on fire, in which case you clearly would mention it, but under normal circumstances. So I get to my front door, having driven four hours from Manchester, I get to the front door and I say to myself, Steve, 149, 149, 149. You'd be a hypocrite if you focused on the 15. And I get to the front door and I open the door to be confronted by shoes in the hall. My, my chimp sees the shoes. I don't see the shoe, the shoe goes, ah! I say, say nothing, we're only 10 seconds in. Four minute rule, can't say a word. And I shovel past the shoes. I get to the kitchen, I can smell food. She has indeed cooked a meal. I open the kitchen door to be confronted by so many pounds and so much mess. And my chimp goes, ah! I say, say nothing, we're only 30 seconds in. Say nothing. And I smile at the wife. She smiles through all the steam and the mess and the mayhem with her beautiful green eyes. She looks at me. She goes, I didn't hear you come in. I go, well, I'm here. What are we having? With so much mess, I'm thinking it's gonna be a three course gastronomic feast on a Friday night. And she looks at me and smiles and says, I'm trying something new. And I go, really? And then she says, what are we having? She goes, soup. And I think, soup? How can it be soup? I say nothing, I just go, brilliant. If there's one thing I was hoping for after a 14 hour day, it's a nice bowl of hot soup. And then I realize amidst all the mess of the mayhem, there's a 149 because a pan has been placed on a mat for the first time in 29 years of marriage. This deserves some praise and recognition. And I'm about to say, hey, well done, I'm using a mat there. And then I realize on closer inspection, at least my chimp spots it, it's not a mat. It's an HMRC letter that I specifically mentioned needed to be mailed lest I go to prison. And there's a pan on it. And I go, ah, I'm just gonna go and have a shower for two and a half hours. And when I'm in the shower, magical things happen. As so I get to think and pause and ponder and reflect and think it's your crazy wiring that you acquired from your mother in your formative years that makes you think tidiness matters that much. No one's got cancer, no one's dying, the family is sweet, food's in the fridge, you can pay your bills. Let it go, son, let it go. And 15 minutes later, I'll come down refreshed, haven't had my shower, so it's probably a bit longer than four. I walk into the kitchen, I've said nothing I regret. There's a nice atmosphere for the whole weekend. Can you imagine, by the way, when I read Steve Peter's Chim Paradox book, if there's one thing that was really disappointing reading that book, I was looking for the bit that said how to remove unhelpful wiring. And it's not in there. Apparently, this is staying with me. It's not going anywhere. So you see, I have to have a mechanism. Steve calls it the pause button. I call it the four minute rule. You can call it what you like, but it means you, you just stop and think and reflect and allow the chimp to calm. Because without that, guess what would happen? This would overwhelm me. I'd walk through the front door. I could teach that all day long. 149, positivity, find the good, give more praise, give more encouragement. It wouldn't happen. I'd walk through and go, who's got these shoes? Is this where we put shoes now? By the way, I should point out four feet from something we like to call a shoe cupboard. Guess whose shoes are in that? Mine, colour coded left to right. Nobody else seems to know how to put stuff in it. Sometimes if my chimp gets carried away and I don't manage it very well, I'll start narrating, tidying up. I'll go, I'll put the shoes in the shoe cupboard, shall I? Cause, ah. And I'll go off on one and then I get to the kitchen and go, ah, the pan thief's been in. What we having? Hot water and veg. That's what I need after a 14 hour day. Excellent. <gasps> and I get to go to prison. You didn't have time after your Zumba 
the class to learn the letter, did you not? I was up at four o'clock. I drove three hours. I've cheered teachers up against the world for six and a half hours. I drive home three and a half hours in a car. I get hot water and vegetables and a prison sentence. Lucky me. I go and have a shower. I come back down. There's a nightmare atmosphere. Guess who's caused it? The motivational speaker. All because I didn't do the four minute rule. You're welcome. You are welcome. I know, by the way, I did an event the other day, these, these therapists and, and CBT people, and I, put, I said at the end, survey, how many people are going to use the four minute rule tonight? There was about 70 in the room and a good 50% went, I'm using that tonight when I get in. It'll transform your world. It doesn't make your house tidy, but it transforms your world. And all you got to do, by the way, on a serious note, when my daughter messages that, that fateful night and said, you're not going to like what I'm about to say. My relationship with food isn't good. We drove up to see her, obviously, and we sat with her and we talked and we talked. And the, the saving grace for my daughter is she talks. It's really good that we can get it out of her system. And I said to her, I, I just taught her that. I didn't teach her on a flip chart. You know, I don't walk in my daughter's bedroom and go, darling, daddy's here, right? I just, talk, I just drew on a bit of paper and I said, I don't expect you to read The Chimp Paradox. I don't expect you to read the book. It's a lot of work. It's a big, big book. But the principle's good to know. It's good to know that there's a force in your brain that sometimes overwhelms you. It's good to know that there are certain bits of wiring. So if this was Anna's, if this was my daughter Anna, that would be body image. Does that make sense? That would be body image. That would be her seeing herself in a distorted way. So, and, sh and she now knows, and, and the, from the minute, this is three, four years ago now, she now knows there's this force. And quite often when she has a bad day, she'll say, I know it's my chimp. So she's able to almost rationalize the irrational, which helps her to understand the world a little bit differently. And I think that's a good awareness to have. If you teach nothing else to people, let them understand the power of this force that's sometimes emotional and sometimes quite catastrophic in its thinking. Now, the question for you and I, and the bit I'm going to share with you now, is what do we do about it? If I can't get rid of this wiring, how can I put some more helpful wiring in here? So I'm going to share a little technique with you now. I'm not going to get you to practice it because I haven't got time. Normally on workshops, I'd get people playing with this stuff, but you can do what you like with it, really. But... So it's called a GOB. A GOB stands for Glimpse of Brilliance. It's a psychological principle where if you were to timeline my life, that's my past, that's my future, anything good that's ever happened to me comes under the heading of a glimpse of brilliance. Any event, any experience, many of the things that were shared this morning on some of the more positive stuff, you know, when you have an experience, when a woman comes in and has an amazing birthing experience, like everything goes well, they had a birth pool, which Abby did for our first, you know, and the child arrives and everything's good and family's happy and it's one of these most incredible moments in life and you facilitated that experience, That's that would be a glimpse of brilliance all day long. Now, I know there are glimpses of misery as well, but that's glimpse of brilliance. So what I did with my daughter, I've done this with loads of organisations. I've done this with Santander, I've done this with organisations, trusts, departments, surgical teams, you name it, I've done it. And I exp explain this. This is a gob file. My daughter knows all about this stuff. A gob is a glimpse of brilliance. It's any experience that's gone well in the past that you were involved in. So we went up to Chester and I bought her a gob file. This is mine. It's got me uh, emails, messages from anything anybody's ever said that's good. I've now got a gob file in my email box, which I could go on to, click open. And there's a list of emails. Thanks, Steve. Use your four minute rule. Really help me. Love the 149, applying it at home, really, you know, whatever. And I, I love it when I get that feedback because it keeps me going. So I got Anna to buy a little file and I says, here, what are you going to do? When you go to bed at night, what do you normally do, sweetheart? She says, well, what I do normally is I pick this up and I lie in bed and I flick through it and I go to a really inter interesting app called Instagram. And she says, and you look at it and then you go to sleep and then you get up the next morning and you get your phone out and you check Instagram. And Instagram's brilliant, by the way, because you get to see everybody else's lives are better than you, better looking than you, got a better skin than you, better social lives than you. And everybody else's world is generally much better than yours. What a great way to go to sleep when you're feeling a bit low about yourself. And then in the morning, just in case the world hasn't changed much, pick your phone up and just double check that you're still failing compared to everybody else. And then go to school and be told your bum's too big. See how you cope with that. Or you could. Still use Instagram. I appreciate it has a marketing benefit and people need to see your profile and I get all of that. But maybe the last thing you do is this. You buy a little journal, which I bought for her, with a little flower on the front. And I said, when you go to bed tonight, the last thing you're going to do, once you've done all of that stuff, is you're going to get a pen and you're going to write down three things that went brilliantly well. You're going to say, did a triple pirouette in front of the class, got asked to repeat it by the head of ballet, nailed it. 
landed it. The girls cheered. It was amazing. Sat and had tuna, sweet course, sweet corn and pasta to feed the machine. So I had strength to dance till six o'clock. I loved the food. Finally sat and watched Goggle Box with the girls. The camaraderie was amazing. We laughed so much. And then I fell asleep. And then you get up in the morning and the first thing you do isn't that. It's that. And you pick it up and you read them. But you don't just read them. You replay them. Just for 20 seconds, indulge yourself. Play the movie of you two in that pirouette. Feel the landing. Listen to the girls cheering. The second one is taste that food again and how good it felt to feed the machine for the evening dance. And finally, replay the little sentence on Gogglebox that made you giggle. And just have another laugh. And then when you go to school, simple objective. Pay attention to the globs. Because on tonight, when you go to bed, you're going to have to do it all again. Sit down, turn to the next page. By all means, read the previous three and then write three more down. And then in the morning, read them again. After a month, you'll have 100. And notice how it makes you feel. This is a strategy I've used in sport. I've coached professional golfers. I coach the England Wheelchair Rugby League squad. My job is to help them get a 149 mindset and pay attention to the success. Success leaves clues. And by the way, when she goes to school the next day, somebody will still say, your brain's too big. And it will still hurt. And it will still be awful. But you will have a resource to go back to, to remind you that there are so many good things happening. And then eventually, talk about build resilience. I call it psychological armor. You almost build a thicker skin. And, it, and by the way, glimpses of brilliance, just in case you haven't joined the dots, they gobs fit in here. You play these little movies over, play good movies, keep reinforcing the movie, and it just gets more and more embedded. This is never going anywhere. It's still going to raise its ugly head. It's still going to turn up, but this stuff starts to become more prevalent. I can access that much, much faster now. My good experiences, right? I've spoken to 3,000 audiences over the past, um, over the past 20 years. I used to get nervous in the early days because it was new and you didn't know what was going to happen and you were a bit anxious about the results and could you win the crowd and would they all love it? And I'm wise enough to know now that they won't all love it and sometimes it won't be perfect doesn't stop me putting the effort in. I'll always turn up with 100%. You never know if it's going to work out, but I'll always give it everything. And the one thing my wife always says to me is, Steve, how did it go? And I'll go, honey, I don't really know, but I gave it my best. I gave it everything. I couldn't have given any more. I've got a friend called Chris Akabusi. Some of you won't know, some of you know him. He's an ex-athlete, Olympic silver medalist. And him and I, best, best friends. We see each other regularly and share our lives together. And Chris said to me one day, he says, do you know what confidence is? And he came from foster care, Chris, and he, he, was, he grew up and he became an amazing athlete and a TV celebrity and all that stuff. And I said to Chris, I'd love to hear what you think it is. He says, confidence is the belief I can be, the best that I can be, but not necessarily to always be the best. And I said, is that because you got silver? And he goes, no, it's because no matter how hard you run, no matter how hard you try, you rarely win the race. In fact, as an athlete, you lose probably 90 percent of them. There's always somebody who's better than you, potentially training harder, maybe. Maybe they've got less injuries than you. Maybe they've got a new technique you haven't learned yet. But you always know that progress isn't linear. It's kind of that. And he says, and you always accept those doldrums because you know you're going to come through if you just keep going. So he says, confidence is doing the best that you can with what you have. And I think in the world that you're in, that's unbelievably relevant because it doesn't matter how many resources, how many staff, how much of a good intention you have. Sometimes it just doesn't work. Is that fair? Sometimes you just don't get the results you deserve. And I've got four minutes left and I want to share you a little story on that. Uh, but before I do that, I'm just going to give you five tips. The tips are all based on glimpse of brilliance. And then I've got a little two, three minute story to finish. And then I promise you, you can just go your merry way and I will send you some follow up notes. This is a study that was done by KPMG. They found their tax managers uh, were suffering from increased levels of sickness. Just 2008, this was just after the global recession kicked in. Uh, depression was being reported. Um, low mood and low performance. So they split their workforce into two halves and made half of them do one of five interventions and the other half do nothing different and then compared their mood, levels of depression, etc. at the end. The result was, I'll tell you what the five things are in a second. Uh, after three weeks on every metric, the experimental group scores were significantly higher than the control group. We tested both groups again four months later. The experimental group still showed significantly higher scores in optimism and life satisfaction. In fact, participants on 
on, on the life satisfaction scale, a metric widely accepted to be one of the greatest predictors of productivity and happiness at work moved from 22.96 on a 35 point scale, 27.23. Just one quick exercise a day kept these tax managers happier for months. What did they have to do? What was this amazing intervention? Well, a bit like my daughter, it's not rocket science to write three things in a book, is it? Let me tell you what the three things are, the five things are. You do one a day, every day for three weeks. The first one is jot three things down and you're grateful for. The second one is write a positive message to someone in your social support network. Being kind to other people, supporting other people is the most predictive indicator of productivity and happiness at work, right? Just doing that. Meditate at your desk for two minutes. Get, get to Ruby's book and play a bit of audio from that. Exercise for 10 minutes. I lied. I said it was all two minutes. That one's a bit longer, but that means going for a walk without your phone, right? Just not being in the switching off. You know the old sharpen the saw analogy? You know, you think, oh, I'm taking 10 minutes out. I'm doing less. No, you're not. You're putting your mask on first. You're sharpening your saw. You're better when you come back. And the final one is take two minutes to describe in a journal the most meaningful experience of the past 24 hours. That's pretty much what I got my daughter to do. My daughter is now working as of Monday for Stranger Things Experience in London. She's an actor now. She's got the best dream job of her life. And she's connecting with Netflix and doing all these wonderful things. And it's in no small part to be able to stop, pause, pay attention to what works, what's positive in her life. I've had to force it into her a little bit. And it isn't by any means a cure, but it certainly helps. I'll leave you with one final thought. And then, as I said, I'll, I'll send materials out. If you want to get a hold of me after today, by the way, ask me questions direct. I'll send my email, my mobile, and just contact me. And I promise you, I'll get back to you. 25 years, I told about my wife and I, and I'm a fairly positive person, I think. You know, not overly so, but I think I'm, I'm reasonably good at finding the 149. Um, we got married in 1993 and in January 1995, well, during 1994, we got in, uh, pregnant. We got pregnant, both of us. Anyway, Abby was pregnant with twins and sadly we lost the twins at birth. It was It's, it's a very long story behind that. But the bit I want to pick up on for you is this. We went to the Royal Box Hospital. She was in labour at 21 weeks. It was obvious from the second we arrived this was not going to be a happy ending. I can tell you that was 20 years ago, eight, yeah, seven years ago, a long time ago, right? Crazy time ago. Clearly it's a happy ending because we've got Christopher and Anna. Uh, we lost a boy and a girl that night. The midwives were incredible. They stayed with us, someone called Alison, Mary, Trudy. I remember everyone. I can picture their faces. I can picture the faces. It was such a long time ago and yet I can still see them. They stayed with us through a 17 hour ordeal. Eventually, there was an intervention to get the babies out because they didn't want to really cause any harm to Abby and we lost them. We left the hospital with nothing. Trudy sat on the bedside with us and said, you two are going to be all right, you know. I didn't say, how do you know that? I trusted her. She's a senior midwife. I thought, she must know stuff. She must have seen this before. And if it wasn't for those little comments, those moments, they even took pictures of the babies. I hope you still do this, by the way. It's an awful experience, but do you still do that? They took pictures of the babies, they said they gave us them to take away, put on a mantelpiece, we acknowledge what was going on. We didn't want to see our babies. We didn't want to see dead babies, but they encouraged us to after four or five hours of a bit of counselling, and we saw them. And it was heartbreaking, but it was important we saw them because it was a line. It was like, this has happened and it's real. And we took these photographs of our beautiful babies home and we moved on. Trudy sat in the bed that night as we walked out and she, she held us. She got a hold of us and she said, I promise you, you know, I know this is the worst night of your life, but you're going to get through this. You're going to do this. You two are going to be fine. She, just, she was amazing to hear it from her. I wouldn't have believed anyone else. If your mother had said you're going to be fine, if my dad had said, if anybody, but me and Abby walked out thinking we're going to be fine. And then we went and pursued some reports. We needed some fertility help. And two years later, Christopher was born. And four years later, Anna was born, a magician and a dancing actress, right? I promise you, we would not be, I wouldn't be standing here talking to you today if it wasn't for the people that night that encouraged us. We thought it was the darkest end of, what's the point? And we just needed these people. They even came to the house. They even came to the funeral. I'm guessing they got overtime for that. No, you just turn up, don't you? It was an awful moment, but I don't think that, we went back every year, by the way, when the kids were born to show how quickly they were growing, when we had our babies, that, you know, you do an amazing job. Clearly, there are some awful experiences. I hope most of them are good, but never underestimate the power of the words that you use, the encouragement that you give, the tap on the shoulder, the smile. That matters hugely. I promise you, my whole business is built on stories about my family. 
I've only got a family because of the Trudys, the Allisons and the Marys in the world, who we still keep in touch with today. And I just think if you can leave that legacy in the world, what a bloody difference that is. Having meaning, and it, you really have meaning, even when it isn't great, keep doing what you do because it really, really makes a difference. And even though I look back on that experience and think it was a bloody big 15, because of Trudy, Mary and Allison, it was a one four nine. And we've got a lovely family because of it. And it's because of people like you doing what you do. So I just want to say thank you for inviting me in. I hope today has helped you with a few little nuggets and little tips. I will send me follow-ups. Thanks, Jill, for allowing me to do this little session. And I wish you the best of luck with all the challenges ahead. That's it. I'm done. I'm finished. Thank you. Thank, thank you for that. And, and as always, what I hope is that, that we take this away and actually we put this into practice and we just ease up part of the reason I think why Abby, Jill and I, it was important to have you here was to just give people some time to think about how they are themselves. I think we all recognise that staff have been through a really, really challenging time, a time like no other, irrespective of all the pressures that we know exist in the NHS and that were there well before the pandemic. So mm. there's that plus on top of that. And particularly for me, the challenge that our midwifery colleagues are going through at the moment, I think it was just to have that time. So thank you. The four minute rule I absolutely am going to employ when I walk in my home and there are pairs and pairs and pairs of shoes in the hallway and the kitchen is a tip and nobody's worked as hard as I have today. So um, thank you for that, Steve. I shall uh, share that with my two daughters and my husband. <laughs> Good luck with that tonight. I wish I could be a fly on the wall as you teach them that tonight. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Um, I hope that all of you have enjoyed it this morning we do these for you we hope you get something out of it i am an absolute advocate for trying to give people some headspace to just think about what we do and these are absolutely that for all of you again abby it's just been fantastic the i know you are passionate about these so it's a huge thank you to you maria for organising this. Jill, thank you for putting us in, in touch with Steve. That was brilliant. It was fantastic. We need to think about how we take this forward. Um, I'm going to draw us to a close. I'm conscious we are four minutes over. Abby, is there anything you want to add before we uh, draw it to a close? Just to say a huge thank you to the speakers and thank you to everyone for coming today. Lovely. Right. Have a lovely weekend, everybody. I hope you're enjoying the cooler weather. Um, and we'll see everybody soon. Thank you. I'll send my follow-up notes straight away. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Steve. Yeah. See you no later. Worries. See ya. Take care.